Like temperatures shattering records across the country. Taking off everything, this is it. I'm wearing a t-shirt for the first time in six or seven months. I don't know what it is. It's, it's fantastic. Perfect day. We'll have your full forecast, including how long the rain and heat will last. Also ahead, Henry's legacy. NBC's Richard Engel remembers his son Henry, who died of Rett syndrome, and takes a look at the work that continues to find a cure for the rare disorder. Our Rett syndrome research will continue to push as hard as possible to develop treatment. This is how we will honor Henry's life. This morning, the touching tribute to Henry from the doctors who worked with him. Plus, Jamie Foxx hospitalized, the actor recovering from what his family is calling a medical complication. His daughter taking to social media, sharing an update on her father's condition. We'll have the latest. And the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the stars of the hit show, are here in Studio 1A ahead of their fifth and final season. They'll tell us about their last days on set and the secrets from behind the scenes. Today, Thursday, April 13th, 2023. Thirteenth birthday gift. A trip to New York. And a Today Show. Celebrating 40 years of friendship from, from Boone, Iowa. From Harbor, Washington. Washington. Celebrating my 50th and my 78th. Out of my mom watching. And in Douglas, Georgia. Georgia. On a mother-daughter trip. From Greensboro, North Carolina. Three generations. From North Dakota. Iowa. And Rhode Island. Out of my friends in Waynesboro Middle School. And Tennessee. <laughs> Shout out to Cairo, Tennessee. To my grandma, 93 years old, who watches today every day in Cleveland. We, we love, love you! you. <laughs> Welcome back. In August of last year, our dear colleague Richard Engel and his wife Mary lost their beloved son Henry to a rare genetic neurological disorder called Rett syndrome. But a team at Texas Children's Hospital has hope and a way for Henry to live on. Richard and Mary, we're so happy that you're here. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's good Hi. to be here. Very <laughs> obviously difficult story, but this was an, a nice event mm -hmm. and it was touching for both of us. We just mm -hmm. came back from Houston and the doctors there and researchers who worked with Henry decided to honor him mm -hmm. by dedicating a balcony in his name to recognize his life, which was far mm -hmm. too short, and also to recognize his contributions to science, which are ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. yeah. Our son Henry was our everything. <laughs> Sweet, beautiful and determined. Good morning, good morning. Good morning good but he was also good morning, unlucky. Good morning, born good morning, with a rare morning, genetic morning. disease called Rett syndrome. A single devastating typo in his genetic code robbed him of the ability to walk, talk, and control his body. It also caused numerous underlying health conditions, including impacting his breathing. But my wife Mary and I, she was the main caregiver, never quit for a moment, and neither did Henry. With regular therapies to keep his body moving and his mind active, he was making progress, learning to take a few steps in his walker and communicate with cards and a computer. When his little brother Theo arrived, he poured in love too. For most of his life, Henry was, in spite of it all, happy until his last few months when he developed a new condition, dystonia, uncontrollable shaking and muscle contractions. His underlying health issues got much worse. And we appreciate you taking the time to celebrate the life of Henry Thomas Engel. Until it was too much. But Henry's journey continues. This week in Houston, at the Duncan Neurological Research Institute, they celebrated him dedicating a balcony in his name. Our Rett syndrome research will continue to push as hard as possible to develop treatment. This is how we will honor Henry's life. Dr. Hoda Zogby, who discovered the genetic cause of Rett syndrome, believes Henry's cells hold the secrets to finding a cure. They're still using his preserved cells for cutting edge research. Henry had no bad qualities, no, none, <laughs> zero. But the one that 
I thought about, and I was thinking about today, was his tenacity. He was so hardworking, and he had to do so much that a child should not necessarily have to do. Um, but he did it, and he did it most often with a smile, and he just never gave up. It didn't happen in his lifetime, but with his cells still working, still contributing to science, it would be an amazing, miraculous le legacy. That we're and he forward will. To. He definitely will. While there are other children suffering from Rett syndrome, Henry's specific genetic mutation had never been seen before. And for science, one of a kind is valuable. Does the research with Henry's cells have the possibility to advance other kinds of neurological issues? Absolutely. And you can apply that to hundreds of forms of autism where only one copy of the gene is missing, but the other copy is still there. What was it like for you and members of his research team who worked so closely to learn that he hadn't made it? So that was one of the hardest days in our career. I would share openly with you, we all cried. We lost our son, our Henry. He was almost seven years old, but he will always be with us. And even now, he's hard at work to help other children whose lives are more difficult than they should be. Mary hey, Richard, mm -hmm. so thank you for your courage yeah. to be here and, mm -hmm. and to tell the story. And Mary, you said something so wise that you just, you, you want this to work to go on. You don't mm -hmm. want to see anybody else have to go through what Henry and no, you we went don't. through. No, we don't. We think of this as, um, you know, we, we have a vendetta <laughs> against yeah. the syndrome and we want it, we, we want to cure it. We don't want anyone else to go through this. We don't want any, other child to lose their life. I mean, we, you know, Henry lost his life to Rett syndrome, and mm -hmm. it, we want it gone. The science is so important, and watching you guys, you talk with the doctor and seeing the advancement. Um, but for a lot of people, it's a, it's a child who you lost. And I was just wondering, because a lot of people have to cope with things, where's the place that you put your grief? You had an exercise that you do that I think might be helpful um, to others. Yeah, so I was just, yeah, I, this is something, well, this is something I'm gonna start to do. Mm -hmm. um, I've been, long walks really help. Mm -hmm. um, also just, when it comes over me, and, and, and I think about Henry all the time, I just go with it because to push it down and try to not feel it doesn't mm. help at all. Um, but a good friend of mine, um, Elizabeth, who I think is watching, mm -hmm. uh, she um, lost her daughter and she told me about, um, that she writes in a journal every night, a letter to Caroline. Mm. And I thought that was just wonderful. So I ordered a journal mm. and I'm gonna start to try to do that. Cause I think that ending my day with writing to Henry and just saying, this is what we did today. You're still part, you know, he's still, our, he's still very much part of our family. Mm -hmm. Will, will help. So it's always, it's evolving, you know, yeah. picking up things along the way. Sure. And so. he's still working for other mm -hmm. children. Yeah. How are you doing, Richard? Mm -hmm. This was uh, obviously tough, but it was also positive mm -hmm. because we're trying to keep this going. We're trying to keep the fight going. There are a lot of families out there who saw our story, heard about Henry's mm -hmm. story over the years, mm -hmm. and we want to let them know that we haven't given up, mm -hmm. that Henry hasn't given up on them. We're all still we're, we're all still in this because there's a killer out there, mm -hmm. and we're making progress, mm -hmm. and and we want to keep it up mm. until till we can settle this score, mm. this horrible disease. Mm -hmm. well, we're not giving up hope. Yeah. We we'll continue to tell this story. We we'll continue to remember Henry. You two, mm -hmm. I've said yeah. it a million times. Okay. You're my heroes. Amazing, amazing. Um, and Mary, you are an incredible writer mm -hmm. yourself, just like Richard, and wrote a beautiful essay for us mm -hmm. on grief. Mm -hmm. um, and it is on today.com if people want to read. And also, if you want to contribute to mm -hmm. this work, the work continues for Henry. Mm -hmm. So I hope we can all be part mm -hmm. of it. And you have been. Thank yeah. you very much.
talking to a boat full of men about diaper cricket. I wonder if somewhere on the East River there's a male comic talking to a boat full of women about power tools. <laughs> Ironic that Diddy Do Diaper Creep was invented by men. I mean, men are masters of the universe. Wheel, fire, war, etc. But babies? Not really their domain, is it? Every time a man holds a baby, it ends in screaming tears. And then the baby gets upset, too. There you go. We're back with some laughs, courtesy of the upcoming season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It is hard to believe it has been six years since the 1950s wow. housewife first walked up to the mic, launching her comedy career. Well, guess what? Now, 20 Emmys, three Golden Globes, and a whole lot of jokes later, the hit show is ready for its fifth don't say it so, and final season. Oh, joining us now is Midge Maisel herself, Rachel Brosnahan, Tony Shalhoub, who plays her dad, Abe, and of, Kat, of course, Alex Borstein, who plays Midge's manager, Susie. Y'all, we can't, Al and I are so bummed that this is the final season. Yeah. How is it, how is that sitting with you, Rachel, in this moment? It still hasn't sunk in. Yeah. And I think especially this week, we've gotten to spend so much time together mm -hmm. talking about the new season. It still kind of feels like we're right. in it. So yeah. we're going to have a crisis as soon we're, as this week is yeah. over. We're in a state of deep denial. Yeah. You're denying it. <laughs> Did y'all yeah. want it to keep going, Alex? Yeah. And what, yeah. what happened? What'd they say? Uh, Rachel wanted to do a movie. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, hang on a second. No. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, five seasons is a good yes, chunk good of change. Run. Yes. And you want to tell a story. And yeah. the, I, I think they feel like the story is told, but it's told so well and it ends so well that you're still left with some good questions. And yeah. So what happened when they yelled, when they called cut on the final. Yeah, really want to know? Yeah, tell us exactly. Well, before they yelled cut, Amy made it so that the last scenes were like everyone was on stage. It was ensemble. Oh. And we could barely get through. We couldn't, like, there we was a lump. We couldn't look at each other. In my throat that oh. was horrendous. And then on the very final words that were uttered, confetti fell from the ceiling and oh, champagne wow. flutes came oh, out. My and we were all crying so much that the confetti stuck to our faces. <laughs> Tony, what is, what has this show meant to you? I mean, we've watched you all over the years do so many different things on TV, movies, Broadway. But what is this show? How has it been different? This has been uh, a real highlight for me. I mean, um, you know, uh, being a father myself, playing a father to, yeah. to this, working with this cast, these writers, this whole creative team, it is kind of like the frosting on top of yeah. the frosting. You know, I, I gotta say, for you two, you guys, your love story, basically, mm -hmm. this relationship, mm -hmm. was really the core of this. And, and, mm -hmm. and for you, Alex, for you, Rachel, especially having two women so mm -hmm. fleshed out, yeah. uh, you know, not being a sidekick, but being real Finally, people. Finally, yeah. yeah. It shouldn't feel as radical <laughs> yeah. as it does anymore, but it does. And it's been really exciting. You know, we've been on the air for five seasons over the course of six years, and in those six years, we've seen a lot more shows come out that have mm -hmm. the landscape These changed. dynamic female characters at the center and that's been really exciting but, it, but it's, it's not just this love story yeah. you've got Shirley and you've got yeah. Tess my sister and you've got Rose and you've got so many female characters and you've got Tony and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> Tony <laughs> and Tony don't forget yeah. Tony you know sometimes you know when you have lightning in a bottle and sometimes it surprises you mm -hmm. so season one did you feel Rachel did you say like wait there's something different about this or were you just hopeful like you've been for other projects we knew it felt special Special. You know, I think yeah. all of us from the first time we read the script yeah. and then at every stage, it felt like it was something special. It felt like it was something different. We were working it with people at the top of their game mm -hmm. and the script was so sharp uh -huh. and so funny and so smart. But we've all been a part of shows that we're so proud to be a part of that we love that just don't find an audience. Yes. And so right. the, yeah. we Sometimes just you read it or land. Like, this is so good, yeah. it's not going to possibly. Yeah. Like, yeah, because <laughs> it's it's too no good. one's going to watch it. people to watch something. it. Yeah. How, but tough, it just, yeah. how yeah. tough was it doing this show in that the word count in the script, I mean, it's this bam, bam, How do you bam, remember bam, bam, everything? How do you do that? Yeah. It's a muscle. Did you just memorize? a lot of work. <laughs> it was horrendous, and there's a lot of tantrums. I throw a lot of tantrums when I get it wrong. How does it go? How does a tantrum go for I you? I can't say it. Oh. On, on, no, really? I can't speak that way on of television. Oh, you yeah, are? You You're like that? Oh, yeah. And who's, I the just best, who's the best at memorizing of you three? 
Rachel Brosnan. Oh, no, Rachel. Question. no question. No question. What's oh. your technique? She's what do you do? I have what a do you, lot of help. No, but My, what do you do? Honestly, do you just honestly, repeat, repeat, repeat? Yes. Repeat? Like okay. someone will follow me around with a script all day long, just no, run. Let's be honest. The truth. Uh, what? You, what you do is you get a time machine and you become someone who's thirty. <laughs> I was 25. twenty-six when we started the show. That helped. Yeah. When yeah. you're younger, you can yeah. do it a little bit. You just run all day and all night long. Everyone in my life has run scripts with me at some point. Really? Yes. You know, when shows end, a lot of times people are not happy. Yes, with they don't that, like it. That finale. Are, are fans going to be happy with the end of Mrs. Maisel? No. I well, I, think I mean, we're, we're going to be on the show that itself. It's over, but yeah. I, think, I think they've landed the plane really well, and, oh. and it's so satisfying. That's the word um, I would use. It's really satisfying. Satisfying? Yeah. Yeah. But it leaves you with. Some questions. It leaves you with 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 possible, you know, choose your own ending. Oh, oh that's wow. interesting. He's Did you all steal anything from the set yeah. to take yeah. with you? What'd you get? We can't. Can we say that? Sure. Yeah, okay. you sure can. You can. It's I've okay. been telling everyone. <laughs> What'd you take, Rach? I took uh, Midge's rings, oh. which she's had since season one, oh. and performs in as Mrs. Maisel. Uh huh. Took a piece of art from Midge's apartment and oh. a whole bunch of coats. Oh, you went for it. Wow. Oh, I went for it. I took all of uh, Midge's underwear. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you take, Tony? Please don't tell I anyone. I took uh, an, Aer an Aeroflex camera. I, I don't, <laughs> just uh, one of the one of our actual cameras. Wow. Well, Are they worth a lot? I don't know. Yeah, I would hope so. Well, all right. we'll, we'll I actually out. took. I kept Susie's keys that oh. go around her neck. Oh, that was oh, what that's I wanted. Sweet. So. Well, you guys, we loved having you. Um, and you guys are going to be back on the fourth hour to chat with us a little bit more. You can okay. catch the final season of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It's on Prime Video starting tomorrow. We love you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for a oh, great run. Thank wow. You. For having us. So good. And we are back with two of the biggest names in college basketball and social media, Haley and Hannah Cavender, after a historic season helping lead the Miami Hurricanes to their first ever Elite Eight. The Twins announced this week that they are bidding farewell to basketball to start a new chapter in their lives. And this morning, they are here exclusively on the Today Show to tell us why. Haley and Hannah, good morning. Good morning. Good what morning. a year it has been for you guys. What a, what a busy couple of years. So talk to us about this. You, you, you helped the Canes get to the Elite Eight for the first time ever. Your college basketball careers were on fire. You had one year left of eligibility. And then you guys made the stunning announcement that you're going to leave college basketball. Why? Um, I think after playing all four years together and deciding not to take our fifth year, we just decided there's more opportunities um, besides basketball. Obviously, it's such a difficult uh, position to be in because we wanted to take our fifth year and play and continue, but um, 
I think it came down to just optimizing on um, all the opportunities we have ahead of us. Brian, and speaking of those opportunities, you know, college players can now be paid through the NIL deals, the name, image, and likeness. And you are two of the biggest and really at the forefront of the NCAA players being able to get paid for what they do, essentially. How much has that changed your lives? It definitely has changed a lot. I think it's kind of full circle. You know, we started NIL in New York, and here we are kind of ending it in New York. So I was thinking that on the plane right over here. But um, I think just being able to optimize and to be able to monetize as a student athlete, especially female athletes, because um, not everybody has the opportunity to go pro. So I think we'll be prime examples to show people what you can do after college with NIL experience. Right. So, you know, basketball helped build your following and then you guys had viral videos and you took off and it catapulted you guys into fame. You have millions of followers on TikTok and Instagram, but now you're leaving basketball. So are you choosing the money over the sport? I wouldn't say I'm choosing the money over the sport. I think we had a great career, four years of college basketball. Without um, COVID, we wouldn't even have the opportunity to go back for fifth year. So I think just positioning ourselves to um, be successful beyond the years of college sports. Like yeah. Hannah said, being a female athlete, there's very little chance to go pro and be very successful for women's basketball. So I think being able to you know, show the younger generation, if you prioritize NIL in college, you can set yourself up for um, success beyond basketball or beyond your sport. You know, uh, the, the Canes and your coach were sanctioned because of, of an NIL violation. Mm -hmm. it, it, sometimes those rules don't make sense. You, you had dinner with a booster who ended up paying you later on. Are, are the rules kind of petty and did they come after the Canes in, in sort of a, an unfair way? Um, no, I don't think they are petty or come off the Canes. I think that if you do things the right way, which we're, everything was legal that we were doing um, and follow compliance, that NIL is not an issue. All right, so talk to us about the future. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of speculation. You guys could be entering professional wrestling and the WWE. Yeah, we love the WWE, WWE, their fan base, um, the sport, the fitness side of it. That fits Hannah and I's brain and aligns great with us. And so they're a great uh, partner. And yeah, we're very excited with the future with them. We have a lot of long-term deals too. We just signed two long-term deals, um, one with Cactus AI and another with a media company that truly fits who we are as a brand, um, sports, business, and health and fitness. So we're super excited to announce those in the week. Haley and Hannah Cavender, thank you so much for being here on the Today Show and good luck. I hope to see you guys in the ring. That would be a lot of fun. Savannah, over to you. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. We are here, Tom. We know you're ready for the spring weather. Well, so is Jill and Mother's Day is upon us. Yes. We've got new steals and deals, packed with luxurious gift ideas. Will they ship in time for mom? Yes. Okay, but first, this is Today on NBC. Steals and deals. Guys, Mother's Day is upon us. It's just a month away. Now is the time to start shopping. Jill Martin Brooks, our lifestyle and commerce contributor, is here to help. And as always, we've got that handy QR code at the bottom of the screen. You click it, 
you buy it. Jill, good morning. Good morning. Mothers say this is good. So if you do this now and today, it's done you're and done, done. And you're creative and you get exactly what you want and yes. you don't have to leave the house. Yes. And so it's celebrating moms, bonus moms, godmothers. We have some moms and we sure do. Bonus moms here. I think we have a shot, Tom yeah, Mazzarelli. Yeah, we do. Tom Mazzarelli, executive producer, his mom, his aunties. And his godmother. So all the mother figures in your life we're celebrating today. So okay. Get ready. Okay. Starting with the trademark beauty mode interchangeable iron. So the okay. retail is 99 And you always ask me before, does this really work? How does it How work? How do I do it? The thing with these is you always just have to learn. We have a video if we're going to go to it now or we'll put it on today.com. The retail is $99. So here you go. You get that's three not attachments the one. Oh, okay. within this. So that's if you oh. want those tighter curls. You wrap it around. Now you have to watch the video and learn okay. it. But once you learn it, like you're in and you could do it. Okay. And then there's a second attachment that gives you beachy waves. And then there's a third attachment that gives you another sort of wave, a looser curl. Okay. So just check on today.com. The deal price is $49. That is 50% off. I am mesmerized by that video. I, I know. I could watch it all day. Oh, there's the three for thing. Okay, watch the yeah. video. Okay. So now this is major. If you want this, please go on right now because it always sells out. The Barefoot Dreams Cozy Chic Unisex Robes mm. retail 127 to 135 It's in their cozy chic material. Yes, yeah, very soft and yummy. There's no reason to ever want to take this off. It comes with the bow, so it's already wrapped different colorways, and it's unisex. So please check today.com. Again, these go fast. They're machine washable. How much? Two different styles. Um, so the retail price, 127 to 135 The deal price is 54 That's up to 60% off. That's a great investment. Okay. Again, we love machine washable. You know, moms, Easy we're prices. always cold. We're like, oh, I just have a little chill. Yes. What but can I do? What I love about this is, is that it's a wrap. It's a scarf. It's a blanket on the plane. It's the Barrel Cashmere um, Syrupy. It's seven hundred and fifty dollars. Now this is our biggest deal of the day. It's a soft cashmere wow. blend. It has a little lycra in it, so you'll feel it has a little stretch. Mm -hmm. It's just so yummy and delicious and chic. Take a sundress. Take a tank and jeans. Just throw it on right over. Um, the deal price is $89. That's 88% off. Jeez. This is a major deal. You find these in major boutiques around the country and department stores. So a good investment piece to have yep. um, for yourself or your mom or your bonus mom or your aunt. Your okay, the Skin and Coach Truffle the Therapy okay. Italian Skin Set, the retail 123. So I always love giving you sort of the set to say like, you need a new skin routine. Mm -hmm. If you haven't used anything and it's just like in the drawer, time to declutter, give the gift of a new routine, which is lovely. You get the trio. It's a three-step brightening and lifting face ritual that the brand says will help your skin glow and shine. You get the Morning Dew Cleanser and Face Polish and Cream, which are designed to exfoliate and cleanse. And then the Truffle, Truffle Therapy Dream Night Cream. So it has truffle in it, which is exciting. The retail 123, the deal price for the entire kit in the box, 49. That's 60% off. Okay, let's talk candles. Okay, really quickly, these are always unbelievable. The Seda France richly scented hand poured pagoda mm. candles. Retail 44, 60 hours of burn time, comes in this gorgeous box, very elegant, very elevated. The deal price is $19. Mm. That's 57% off. And then we have, I'm wearing now, the Nissa Jewelry Letter Flower Necklace. We always love that. $218, 14 karat gold dip with a beautiful flower detail and the initials. So Vale, Charlie, you want to layer them. Your significant other, great to buy for yourself as a gift. Also great as a graduation gift. The deal price is $39. That's 82% off. Okay. And last up, we only have a Bring few seconds, home. but Stationery Studio, these are awesome, always an awesome gift. The retail price is $100. You get 40 flat cards or folded, all different designs. You could put the name on it. You get the envelopes. The deal price in the box for the whole set, $39. That is 61% off. So okay. I have you all set for Mother's Day. You did it. Happy you did Mom. it. Go to today.com. You can check it out or just go to the QR code. All the deals are there and there are more exclusive bargains as well. And today does make a commission through those purchases made through our links. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to you. Oh, Man. we're back after your local news and weather. This morning on the third hour of today, he'll be there. Prince Harry RSVPs yes for his dad's coronation, but without Meghan and the kids. What to expect and what the decision could mean for the future of the royal family. We're going to be live at Buckingham Palace. Plus, 
we're feeling thrifty in our consumer confidential. The do's and don'ts of thrift shopping, how to make some extra cash, and what you should never buy secondhand. Then, a mission that began with a simple idea. We had all this stuff. I didn't know where to put it. Now it's grown into something incredible. Dylan sitting down with Jessica Seinfeld to find out how she's making an impact in the lives of thousands of families. And Ali Sheedy live in studio talking about her hilarious new series, Brat Pack Days, and how she's teaching the next generation of actors. Today, Thursday, April 13th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning and welcome to the third hour of today on this Thursday. Do we have anything for Thursday? Thursday? Uh, Friday Eve. Friday oh, Friday Eve. Yes. There you go. I'm Chanel here with Al and Dylan Craig is enjoying some time off. Although it seems like a third of the plaza outside. We're from South Carolina. It's yeah, always when Craig of, goes, they're all here. Cleveland and South Carolina. Yes, yes. Well, hopefully wherever you are this morning, hopefully you can enjoy some time outside today because we're getting an early taste of summer this week. A lot of us are. That's right. I mean, it's gone right from jump winter, <laughs> yeah, jump spring, right to summer. Jumped Right I mean, we're talking record heat for April all the way from the Midwest into the Northeast right here in New York City. For today, we could hit 90 Ooh. degrees. Oh, I mean, yes. Crazy temperatures. And uh, it's like that. It was, in fact, today, over 155 million people across the country will see temperatures 80 or warmer. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, my I do not have my spring stuff out yet. Yeah, well, I, take, a look, take a look at this. You want to talk about difference? What's going on? This is on? Fort mm. Lauderdale live where they're doing deep water rescues. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and, and this is crazy. There were some places in southern Florida, 20 inches of rain mm. fell in just six hours. They're calling this a one in 1,000 year storm. Mm. And there's still a flood watch until tonight because the ground is so saturated and there could be some isolated storms still popping up. Uh, the Fort Lauderdale airport is still closed. They're wow. hoping. There's the airport right now live. Oh my goodness. They're hoping Wait, to, but you can see that's that water. Blacktop? That's water. Wow. That's wow. water on top of the on top of the blacktop. And and there is there you can see some of those areas. Mm. It's just crazy stuff. So hopefully uh folks there get a break and can dry out and assess the damage, but uh, oh this goodness. is one heck of a day. Our best of folks out there. All right, well, turning now to the big news today from across the pond. After months of speculation about whether Prince Harry would attend his father's coronation, we now know that answer. He will indeed be there, but his wife and children will not. So let's go to NBC's Molly Hunter. She's live at Buckingham Palace with the very latest. Hey, Molly. Hey guys, good morning. Chanel, the way that you said the word months is exactly right. We have been wondering for months, will they, won't they, will he come solo? Well, now we finally have an answer from Buckingham Palace. Prince Harry will come. Meghan stays in California. Take a look. Overnight, finally, the news from Buckingham Palace we've all been waiting for. Confirmation that Prince Harry will be attending his father's coronation next month. In a statement, the palace is pleased to confirm that Harry will be at the service at Westminster Abbey, while his wife Meghan will remain in California with Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet. The announcement follows months of feverish speculation over whether Harry and Meghan were invited and whether they would make the trip. When asked about it back in January, Harry said the door was open. If you're invited to the coronation, will you come? There's a lot that can happen between now and then. Sharing the king's big day, Queen Camilla, who will also be crowned alongside King Charles. The fact that Camilla's role is now so important, it's constitutional as well. It will be difficult for Harry, I think, to, to swallow that pill of seeing the embodiment of everything he didn't want. Harry's public confirmed attendance, well past the RSVP date of April 3rd, raises issues of planning and security. Frogmore Cottage is no longer the Sussex UK residence. However, there are other royal households Harry could bunk at for the weekend. In a new biography of King Charles by royal commentator Robert Jobson, now being serialized in the Daily Mail, he cites interviews with insiders and couriers who say financially the post Meghan and Harry slimmed down working royal family was a necessity. Writing, Charles dropped a bombshell saying he couldn't afford to pay for Meghan in the future, as well as for Camilla and for William and Catherine and their young family. This infuriated Harry. But in his last major round of interviews around his book, Spare, Harry suggested there was still optimism. Forgiveness is 100% a possibility because I would like to get my father back. I would like to have my brother back. 
At the moment, I don't recognize them as much as they probably don't recognize me. And for this country that still adores those brothers, it will be a welcome sight to see them together at least for a day. A very welcome sight for many on this side of the pond. Now, guys, we did reach out to Buckingham Palace about that book excerpt. We got a no comment. And as far as, as far as Harry's role, once he gets over here during the coronation, we will have to stay tuned for any more details the palace decides to share. I'll send it back to you guys. All right. Well, it looks like a beautiful day there, uh, Molly, where you are. <laughs> so you got that going so, for you. That. You got that. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. <laughs> All right. So now we know Prince Harry will be there, but there are still so many questions. Will that decision have any impact on his relationship? with the rest of the royal family? Will we see Harry and William reunite? And what is the mood leading up to the historic coronation? For answers, we turn now to NBC royal commentator Daisy McAndrew. Daisy, good morning. Is this the olive branch we've all been waiting for? I think a lot of people would love to think that this is the olive branch, that this could perhaps be the beginning of the thawing of that very frosty relationship, particularly between the brothers, William and Harry. As far as we're aware, they still haven't spoken, they still haven't patched things up. But of course, there will be delight that Harry is coming over. He actually waited until after the official date when RSVPs were meant to be sent and people were concerned that perhaps he wasn't coming. But we do now know that he is traveling solo. You know, I was just thinking, I was telling the crew here, we remember, you know, uh, King Charles, now King Charles, walking Meghan down the aisle back when they got married. And so I thought, well, dang, now, full circle, she can't be there when he becomes king. Should we read into that, the fact that Meghan is out of the picture for now? You're so right to remember that picture because for a lot of people it was the moment of the wedding when we saw yeah. Meghan taking Charles's arm and him escorting her down the aisle. And, and it did tell a thousand words. It seemed to say this is a new royal family, a more modern, a more diverse family. And there was a lot of excitement about that. And now roll forward these number of years and there's real sadness that that relationship between Meghan and the family uh, does seem to be irreparable for now. And of course you think about those children, Lilibet and Archie, that don't have a relationship with their grandfather, were recently christened as prince and princess, really cementing the fact that, yes, they might live in California, but they are senior members of the royal family. And knowing that their mother isn't going to be coming to the coronation, the biggest moment in Charles's life, I think has made people sad and think, well, where is this all going to end? Mm. Well, well, Daisy, to that point, you know, when we talk about coronations, it's a big deal. But now that the Queen is gone, what's the mood like? Do, are, are, are folks in the UK a little lukewarm about all this? I would love to say no, there's bunting on every building, there's huge excitement building, but actually there is a bit of sort of typical, uh, I don't know, uh, British stiff upper lip about it <laughs> and not a great sense of excitement. However, having reported on a number of jubilees over the, year, that, over the years, that is quite typical of our mentality. The excitement does tend to come a little bit later, so there are people saying it will build, it will come. But there are some details about the coronation that perhaps give us an idea that the family and uh, the palace is concerned about that too. The procession from the Abbey to Buckingham Palace is much shorter than the Queen's was. People saying, is that because they're worried that there aren't going to be the crowds mm. to line a five or six mile journey? It's only a mile and a half. So I think there is some concern that because Charles has been around for so long, there isn't such a sense of excitement mm. as there was when the beautiful young Queen in her right. 20s sure. was coronated all those years ago. Wow, mm. wow. Daisy McKenna. Andrew, you threw a coronation and nobody comes. <laughs> yeah, they'll be there. They'll be there. By the way, again, look at the greenery behind her. It just looks so beautiful there yeah. this morning in London. All right, Daisy. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your expertise. Thank you, Daisy. We'll all go if they need to fill the crowd. Right. You need some yeah. seat, no? seat yeah, we'll, we'll be some extras. <laughs> thank Will you, we? Yeah, I would I totally would, be a yeah, seat filler. Get to dress up. Wear you wouldn't want to be a seat filler at the coronation. You'd be a great seat filler. Uh, yeah. He's like, do you know who I am? <laughs> Al Roker? Have Al you met me? <laughs> Just, your go-to is no. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Just ahead, the do's and don'ts of thrift shopping. Vicki Wynn is here to show us how we can make some extra money and the safest way to buy and sell. Then a little bit later, Jessica Seinfeld on her mission to change lives that began with a simple problem so many parents can relate to. We'll be right back.
We are getting thrifty in this morning's mm -hmm. Consumer Confidential. Buying items secondhand has really been booming in recent years, fueled by savvy teens and Gen Zers looking to save money, reduce consumption, and also kind of look cool. Here to share <laughs> some thrifting strategies and tell us how to protect ourselves, senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn. Vicki, how's it going? Good morning. Being thrifty is nifty, Al. Yes, that's right. And thrifty is the new 50. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how do you be a savvy shopper and, and find stuff that, that's really good, okay, but you save some cash. The first thing is know where to shop, and Americans are really leaning into thrifting. Last year, 272 million people uh, just bought or sold something secondhand, according mm. to OfferUp, and they save $1,700 a year. So mm. in addition to the traditional thrift stores and consignment stores, uh -huh. online, you've got Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, eBay, and a lot of different apps like OfferUp, Mercari, Poshmark, where you can buy and sell secondhand goods. Know what you want, just like anything else, especially if you're on a budget, if you just need the jeans or the boots, mm -hmm. stick to a list. And then shop sites that authenticate if you're looking for luxury goods secondhand. Mm -hmm. So you know mm -hmm. that Gucci bag really is a Gucci bag. Interestingly, things made before the 1990s and uh, clothes made in the USA, Canada, Italy, tend to be of higher quality. So read mm -hmm. those labels. Just know that a lot of times when you're shopping secondhand, you can't return. That's okay. So as we're cleaning out our closets and I just have a pile of things that I want to donate or get rid of, is there any way to make a little money on some of the better quality items? Items. Absolutely. This is vital. This is a great way to make some money and to give your item a chance to be loved by someone else, yes, which makes I think you is feel so less great. guilty about getting rid of it. <laughs> totally. So take inventory of what you have. Start with the kids stuff. Like maybe your kids only played soccer one season. The shin guards, mm. the cleats are in great condition. Go through the cabinets in the garage, the kitchen. Maybe you thought you were going to use that food dehydrator and you used it <laughs> once. Now's the time to get rid of it. You can certainly do that on sites like Mercari and Poshmark. They make it so easy. You take pictures, you write a little description, they'll email you a mailing label. So all oh. you have to do is box it up and drop it in the mail. They take a fee, sometimes 10 to 20%. It's similar to consignment, which we used to do all the time mm -hmm. in person, right? Mm -hmm. Where they'll take 20 to 50%. Usually that works well for big items like furniture or right. uh, jewelry or handbags, things that are a little more expensive that they'll take on mm -hmm. consignment. And of course, consider donating. Dress for Success is a great organization Absolutely. for women. You all yes. know about about it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us are working from home or we're working hybrid. We don't need all those pantsuits mm -hmm. and extra dresses. So donate. Souls for Souls is another one for shoes okay. that helps low income oh. neighborhoods. Souls for Souls. I yeah. About that Souls one. for Souls. No surprise. Secondhand shopping online through social media. I mean, it's huge these days. But how do you stay safe? OK, this is so important because a lot of times these local transactions require you to meet up in person. So yeah, first, right. where are you meeting? A lot of local police departments have no problem with you going to their parking mm -hmm. lot, even their lobby to do that transaction safely. And here's a tip. If that person isn't willing to go to a place like that, yeah. that's a red flag. Yeah. Right? If you're doing a high ticket item, consider meeting in front of a bank and getting a cashier's check mm -hmm. or a certified check for that payment. We've sold cars that way and done wow. it in the parking lot of a bank to wow. make sure that it was safe. Always bring a friend or at least let someone know where you're going. If you don't want to go to the police station, a public uh, sh shopping mall parking lot or yeah. grocery store parking lot is a great place. And let's show you this Facebook Marketplace seller we picked a profile at random just to give you an idea of what you're looking for to make sure that seller is reputable. So okay. see, they have the ratings there. Mm -hmm. Check to see when they joined. Have they been on for a long time? Maybe you have mutual friends because it's local. And look at the reviews to make sure that this looks authentic. And always, if they're selling something that looks too good to be true, mm -hmm. avoid it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So what are the things you should never buy secondhand. Yes, it's good to get a deal, but there are certain things you want to be super careful about, starting with medicine. That's sort of a no-brainer. Yeah. You just don't know how it's been stored, if it's yeah. been tampered with. You mm -hmm. want to be so careful. So generally, medicine is a no-go, whether yeah. it's prescription or not. Mattresses, bedding, and linen, what you're looking for there is mold, dust mites, yeah. bed bugs. Mm -hmm. You got to be careful there. Pots and pans, this is an interesting one, because even pots and pans that are dinged or scratched a little bit, sometimes they can release toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, we were just talking about that, because I have my mom's yeah. pots and pans. Like, I just, I remember when I got out of college, Oh, yeah. gas iron Grab it's okay, oh, right. But, but if it's right. non-stick, yeah. yeah. you want to get rid of that. And same with beauty products. These are things that go on your skin, yeah. makeup. Yeah, that makes you sense. You want, don't want to mess around with yeah. that. Good. Right. Solid as always, Vicky. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you, Vicky. Good to see you. All right, coming up next, a foundation making an impact for decades. Jessica Seinfeld shares what inspired her mission to help families. And then later, she might be the coolest professor in New York City. <laughs> Ali Sheedy is live to tell us about her comedy series and a mini Brat Pack reunion. We'll be right back. <laughs>
We're back with our series, Impact Thursday, and an organization that has been making a difference for years. Jessica Seinfeld, wife of comedy icon Jerry Seinfeld, is the founder of the Good Plus Foundation. The nonprofit helps thousands of families across the country, and I got the chance to sit down with Jessica to find out how it began with just a simple idea. Parents deserve to bring their children into the world mm -hmm. in as least stressful a way as possible. And so I was determined to make life easier for other new parents. When Jessica Seinfeld founded Good Plus Foundation more than 20 years ago, she had one mission, give back to families. All of those families now have a safe space for their mm -hmm. child to sleep. Married to comedy icon Jerry Seinfeld, Jessica realized how quickly their baby daughter was outgrowing her things in 2001. We had all this stuff. I didn't know where to put it. So Jessica mobilized family and friends to help organize a donation drive. What types of items did you start donating in the beginning? We collected strollers and cribs and diapers and all the things that kids outgrow. And then large corporations started saying, hey, we have a lot of excess. Wow. We'd love to give it to you too. So we've moved on from the gently used model to $14 million worth of corporate gear just this year. Wow, and, and so brand new items. Brand new items, mm -hmm. so everyone gets something new. Formerly known as Baby Buggy, Good Plus Foundation's work has evolved over the years. Today, the organization is connecting those brand new goods with nonprofit partners who they say provide services to under-resourced families. The team's unique model is aimed to break down the cycles of poverty that some families experience generation after generation. How do these services work in tandem with the items themselves? When I started this organization 22 years ago, I thought, I just want to get parents stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I realized we weren't really fixing the problem. It was a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. And so our partners, are looking after hundreds of thousands of families and we come in with all the things that they need and a mom will meet with her social worker and that social worker will have diapers and a car seat mm -hmm. and these moments are critical because children can be removed from homes when a parent cannot afford those essential items mm -hmm. and we are here to hopefully prevent that from happening right. to as many families as possible. Good Plus works with 70 partners serving New York City and LA who support both mothers and fathers with programs that include job training, financial literacy, and parenting classes, among others. How important are fathers in this whole puzzle? We said, as an organization, we have to take on fatherhood. We have to support fathers. They just have never been spoken to with a lot of dignity and respect, mm -hmm. and, and everybody deserves that. So all of our 70 on the ground partners, we have a mandate with them. If they receive support from Good Plus Foundation, they have to be father inclusive. The mother of three also hopes she's leading by example with her own kids. How do you think it's resonated with them over the years to, to see what you're doing for other families? I know that they're very proud of me. I feel like maybe Jerry's work is a little more <laughs> exciting and entertaining. My daughter right now, she's graduating in May and she's looking to use her creative writing skills mm -hmm. with an organization with teens who are justice involved. Wow. So I guess it's working. <laughs> it's rubbed off. Good Plus has been seeing the impact of their good work. Last year alone, the national nonprofit donated more than $12 million in products, 2 million items, and served more than 200,000 families. Every time we give a box of diapers, it's just met with too much gratitude because it's been so hard for these families and that is why we keep going. Mm. And here's what's really cool. They're not just helping parents. Good Plus also established this whole training academy for social workers too. So it's all part of their effort to really find solutions to get to the root of systemic pro uh, poverty, really. So they're kind of, you know, I'm in that moment right now where I have all this extra baby stuff that you want to get rid of. But she, all those years ago, took it a step further and started this whole foundation. That's so amazing. it really is incredible. That's and awesome. to find out more about Good Plus Foundation, head to today.com. When you walked right. in, did you go, hello, <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> did you? No. Okay. Oh, cool. So I kept saying, did you say this? Did you say that? She's no. like, no. No. I'm a serious journalist. All right. When we come back, Ali Sheedy is here live to fill us in on the new season of her hilarious comedy. Why'd you do that, Al? Do what? You went like this.
Uh, and Wyatt includes something, he went like this, something special for Brat Pack fans. And then later, dust off the suitcase. We are helping you pack for the next vacation oh, and you shop pack? all day. What'd I say? No, I'm kidding. Including pack? Yeah. the okay. summer dress. Help you Brat We're off yes. the rails. We're going to get back on the rails when we come right back. I don't know. <laughs> Promise. So thrilled being able to welcome the talented Ali Sheedy back to our show. She, of course, rising to fame as part of the legendary Brat Pack, starring in films like The Breakfast Club and St. Almost Fire. These days, you can see her in the hilarious comedy. It's called Single Drunk Female, <laughs> kicking off its second season this week. Allie plays overbearing mom Carol, whose daughter <laughs> Sam is trying to navigate sobriety and recovery. You see, there's a reason. You wouldn't just suddenly throw away a perfectly acceptable job. Uh, of course not. No. It was spur of the moment, you know? It, it felt right to me. Yeah. You must trust your gut instinct, Samantha. <laughs> the body always knows. Like, when I realized I can no longer eat gluten. Well, but you can eat gluten because we had pasta last night. I can eat wheat in pasta form because the Italians grow it differently. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Allie, good morning to you. Good morning. So Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Very so nice. great to have you here. Congratulations. The show uh, gets glowing reviews, one even calling it one of TV's best kept secrets. How would you describe it to someone who hasn't seen it? Um, the show is, um, it's a comedy, but it also has a lot of... Um, a lot of drama in it. I think mm -hmm. a lot of that has to do with the mother-daughter relationship. So Sophia Black D'Elia plays Samantha, who has gotten sober after her life has become a disaster. Um, and she's about turning 29 in um, this second season. And she has to move back home with her mother, mm -hmm. who is me, <laughs> Carol. Um, and the first season was Sam negotiating her first year of sobriety and what was going on in the relationship between these two people, because she's living with me in my house. Mm -hmm. And the second season now is the problem is no longer that she's is she going to drink? Isn't she going to drink? Mm -hmm. um, but this relationship has to get renegotiated. Get yeah. yeah. Because I've, uh, for, she's always been a drunk yeah. for years and years. I've never been there, and now she isn't. And Carol does not know how to renegotiate sure. the relationship. Okay. So. And, and, you know, when somebody says, oh, here's a comedy about recovery. Right. Uh, <laughs> people probably, you probably get that, that kind of reaction. How difficult is it walking that line, mm. uh, you know, for, for a, because that's a serious topic for a mm -hmm. lot of people. Well, Simone Finch is the creator, and she wrote it, um, and it is actually her story, and mm. I am playing her mother. And Simone has a wicked sense of humor, and she's pretty much writing... Her story of recovery and mm. all of the insanely funny, outrageous things mm. that were a part of it. So it's grounded in some kind of reality because right. it really happened with her. Right. And also because she's that kind of person. Right. She's just so funny. So she puts it in. So you can mm. believe the comedy. Yes. And yeah. it also comes from real life. And she is yeah. she has no um, she doesn't worry. Mm -hmm. she, she will be embarrassed and put in some of the her foibles <laughs> sure. and troubles. Right. <laughs> um, this season also features a cameo by former Breakfast Club co-star Molly Ringwald. Yes. You guys are friends. You know, so yes. what, what's it like to be on set together? I mean, mm. do you just kind of have this unwritten you know, dance that you guys can do. We're really comfortable with each other because Molly is a really close friend and she is in my life. 
Mm -hmm. um, we are playing sisters in law. She is there. There needs to be a history there, and yeah. and that um, relate. Oh, there we are. And that relation. Oh. The scene we have takes place at a, at a shiva, so it's there's a lot of tension going on, mm -hmm. and it, it was fun for us to play con that contentious sort of vibe. But also the history was just right there. I right? love it. You know, there was no work that to needed to be up. done with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but earlier we said we're welcome you welcoming you back to the show because let's roll the tape. You were here <laughs> back in 1985 for The Breakfast Club and we asked you at the time about being friends with your castmates. Let's take a look. Uh oh. Are the five of you who made the movie friends in real life? Um, actually, since filming the movie, um, some of us have really gotten to be very, very close. It's hard because there's a lot of time spent apart and things like that, sure. but I think it's one of the greatest things about filming that movie is that I really got to be close to the other people in it, and it's really nice. I love it, and it still holds Look at up. That. Wow. Do you remember that? I, I remember it now that I'm seeing it. <laughs> um, yes, yes. I wish, I mean, I don't know why I don't speak up. Why I'm, I think I was an Alice. Well, how old were you then? What would you say around what age? I feel like, you know, you guys were, so, it was such a big, I don't even know what that would have been like for you guys. Do you remember mm -hmm. at the time? It was overwhelming. Yeah. We didn't know yeah. that movie was going to become such a big thing, and mm -hmm. nobody had any idea. And then it, it did, and it, I, I can see. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's why I asked. I was yeah. overwhelmed. You were probably overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. But you said you formed friendships and clearly. That's really, yes. And really quickly, I mean, they, they say those who can't do teach, but you can do. You <laughs> act, and you are a college professor. I'm here. a college professor. Where? You can call me Professor, professor Ali, Mr. Sheedy. Roker. <laughs> professor Sheedy. <laughs> yes. What do you tell this generation of actors coming up? Um, I work with the kids uh, on camera, so they're theater kids that are learning how to work on camera. And basically, I want them to be able to take care of themselves. I want them to walk on a set and know what they're doing mm -hmm. and not feel like they're at the mercy of some kind of machine that they don't understand. So Ooh. we talk a lot about just being oriented when you walk on, what to expect, that's and great. I want them to feel like they know what they're doing. Wow, mm -hmm. that's That'd be great. great. How cool would it be I having Ali as your college professor? I hope they're watching. I'm cool, y'all. <laughs> she is cool. <laughs> Single drunk female is on Freeform and Hulu right now. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, when we come back, we are packing our bags for shop all day. Some travel must-haves, including the hat you can put right in your suitcase. Then we have some good reasons to plan a trip. We're checking out the hottest music festivals this summer. No matter what you listen to, we'll be right back. Well, in case you haven't heard, we're taking a big trip next week. Our team is heading out to Sonoma County, California next week for the first ever Start Today event focused on wellness. So that means we need to pack. And this morning <laughs> in Shop All Day, we have some packing essentials for your next getaway. And these are things I think everybody watching could perhaps enjoy. Yeah, That's right. So shop, from. shop Today uh, editorial director, Adriana Brock is with us. All you have to do is scan the QR code to see all these projects. Adriana, good to see you. Hey, good, good morning, guys. Okay, so I usually just put them my shoes in a plastic bag just to separate what? them so, no. well, I, and then I pull them I tie no. it close and there you go yes you can do that sure. but 
the bottom line is shoes and clothes should not be mingling in That's your That's what I do. I put them in and a plastic bag. No. We've got the perfect <laughs> packing cube. Uh -huh. This one is really awesome because it can fit one pair of shoes. Right main compartment and uh -huh. then it's got a smaller compartment where you could put some flats oh, so sandals, you could do a sandal or a flat so you and this doesn't two take up one. more room in your bag it's a, it's a little bit higher mm -hmm. but and also gonna, protects your shoes it protects your shoes and you want that so that you just have your shoes in one area mm. you don't have to dig around your carry-on oh, like um, and it also has a trolley sleeve which i think is oh, kind of genius that's cool if you happen to check a bag and sometimes it's a little bit too heavy you could take the shoes out oh, and make it way less oh, that's and just really put it on top idea. of your roller board that's oh, cute very nice Okay, now for all our little okay. essentials. For all your little essentials, a toiletry bag is a must. And this, one, nice. this one is really genius because it kind of opens up flat. And look oh. at all the stuff you could fit in it. It's got two compartments. Ooh, it's plastic. Ooh. <laughs> the bubble wrap. This, is, <laughs> this is TV magic. Wow. When you fold um, it over, does it mix? It, it doesn't because it's got this little compartment. Oh, to wow. it. So How do we know? Together. How do we and do? What's really cool is that it's just so sturdy. It's made with faux yes. leather, but it's got this handle, so you can really pack it with your cosmetics and your toiletries, which sometimes I know for ladies, it's a we, nice big bag. We pack a lot and of it stuff. It opens up. You're yeah. not digging around through like exactly. one. Exactly. I, I, I want. I was just about to say I, I would it. wear this next week. Yes. So this <laughs> with is, a jean jacket. This is Call like the day. ultimate dress. No matter yeah. whether you're going to Sonoma or not, this is a great travel. Could dress. you wear this with flats? You could wear it with flats or heels or sneakers, any type of shoe. What's really awesome is nice. too is that it's comfortable enough that you can wear it on a plane, on a this? train, on a car. Super affordable. Could you, would, um, you with I believe a fox? it's right under forty. <laughs> under forty bucks. Done. Yeah, exactly. I didn't dress, dress it up, dress it down, layer it with a jacket, yeah. you're good to go. Done. I love that. I do too. I yeah. want that one. Can I have the yellow one? I want the purple one. Uh, okay. really it's good well. sunscreen protection. Okay, this is great sun protection, but it's also an uncrushable hat. Is this for men and, and no women? How cool is this? Men and women can rock it. There you go. Look that's at you. Cute. Al, that's cute. Yes. That is you. Look, you look you so wear cute a hat in that one. one. Um, but you guys, it's uncrushable. So you can literally That's pack why it I up. end up not, I buy hats and then I don't use them because they get all smushed. Exactly. Uh, and I feel like go. I feel silly you wearing You can shove this in like you can roll any it up. crevice. Look at that. Exactly. It's, it's got UPF 50 How protection. How do it do? How do it do? How do it do? So cute, right? That's awesome. Okay. Being able to pack a rain jacket in case things go bad. Exactly. You Sometimes Mother Nature has, you know, her plans in store for us and you want to be prepared with a packable rain jacket mm -hmm. this one's great this is for the guys it's got a cotton lining too oh, yeah, it's so warm. it's a little bit cozier than right. your average you know packable rain jacket mm -hmm. which can be a little bit flimsy mm -hmm. but you get kind of like this windbreaker look and the it effect works. of it and Although it, works. It, it would seem that if you got like a small you guys could wear this yeah totally, totally yeah comes in a bunch of colors a bunch of sizes too mm -hmm. we okay. say yes and now for our yes. phones oh my gosh al i know you're you're mr abc abc always be charging exactly <laughs> this is a genius charger because not only is it a portable battery pack mm -hmm. but it has the cords built in oh, you don't yeah. have to worry about packing your cords you for your tablets it. or your phones you, there's the plug right there exactly oh, you boop, just put awesome. it into the wall Wait, this might be... so this is like an all-in-one it's yes. like and a multi you can charge multiple honestly because right. i always lose the cord can you charge more than one thing at a time you almost? can it's got a lightning oh, cable on one side and a USB-C on the other this is so cute. really Everything, really awesome adriana thank you so much these were good Oh, Brought, I mean, yeah. every one of these is a winner. I love it. Perfect I like carry on bag. Break Thank out you. in a song or hey, dance. Uh, if you want to get some of this stuff, check it out today.com slash shop to see all the items. Smooth and we criminal. cannot wait to <laughs> see you in Sonoma County next week for our first ever Start Today event. Our show and the event are both sponsored Woo. by Sonoma County Tourism. All right, up next, some good reasons to pack your bags. We have the scoop on some of the biggest music festivals around the country. We'll Thanks, be right sir. back. Does that look like that? Let's Annie, go. Are you okay? And are you okay? <laughs> <laughs>
Listen up, music lovers. Festival season is here, and we are breaking down some of the hottest music festivals to check out this summer and something to do while you're in town. Our friend and NBC News entertainment contributor Chris Witherspoon is here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning y'all. Okay, so you. festivals yes. can seem overwhelming. Yes. You need to do some planning. Yes. Go through the do's and don'ts. Okay, some do's and don'ts for you. First off, you want to wear sunscreen. Oh. You're going to be out mm. outdoors for hours jamming to music. You don't get a sunburn. Be nursing that the whole time. Right. Also, bring a portable cell phone mm. charger. These are day long events. You want to have juice left in your phone when let's get to the stage and dust some juice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then make a plan. There's stages everywhere. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know where you're going and where these stages are, are, are located. And sanitize. Pack some hand sanitizer because you might be using a porta potty at some point. You want to keep it clean. <laughs> True. And then you're right, though. You're right. And then download a ride share app. So you, you're not in a long line waiting to find parking oh. or get to uh. parking. You can just like zoom That's in, so zip good. in, and zip oh, out. The cat yes. line. And I'd always have the Uber or whatever you do go away from the place. Like, yes. 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 Be willing to walk 10 minutes. Exactly. It's worth the investment. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Also, some festival don'ts for you. Okay. You don't want to wear fancy shoes. A heel might look cute for the gram, oh. but you will be in pain by the end yeah. of the night. And then also, don't wear shoes that you're afraid to get dirty. So yeah. like, leave the Air Force mm -hmm. once the Jordans at home. Then don't bring your valuables. Leave the great sunglasses, the nice jewelry at home. It might fall off and get on the ground. I agree. Then don't take food or drinks from strangers. That mm. sounds very self-explanatory. Just not a good idea. All of a sudden, That's you're like, woo! <laughs> right? And I love a good sharing situation, but at a festival, no. <laughs> All right, let's dive right in. Okay, so the first <clears throat> festival is a must for country music fans. Yes, this is the largest music festival in the country for country. It's called the Stage Coast Festival, uh, April 28th through 30th in Indio, California. You have headliners like Luke Bryan, uh, Luke Bryan, Kane Brown, Chris Stapleton, then three-day general admission tickets starting at $429. Oh my goodness. And oh. then while you're over in that area, a don't miss activity is called Pioneer Town. It's a, it's a, a town that was made in 1946 to film Western movies. It's wow. really cool. They have a stampede on Saturday. Mm -hmm. It is such a vibe. Great restaurants also. So you pay for the whole weekend. Yeah, pay for the whole weekend. Then go see Pioneer Town That's in cool. um in yeah, Joshua Tree. All right. Uh, yes. So Big Easy has a great festival. Oh my God, this is a huge one. This is April 28th through May 7th, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. Mm. Uh, so you got 5,000 musicians. 14 different stages. Ed Sheeran, Lizzo, Jill Scott, hmm. Jasmine Sullivan, uh, Mumford & Son, The Lumineers, John yeah. Baptiste, wow. Her, uh, Ludacris. It just goes on and on and on. Wow. Three-day general admission passes starting at $240 or $85 per day. And while you're in NOLA, go to Cafe du Mall oh, for yes. some beignets and oh, coffee. Yes. That is a must. Mm -hmm. uh, don't miss activity. We say yes. yes. We say yes. yes. All right, now going up to New England, the Boston Calling Music Festival. More than 50... Performers. This is going to be huge. Boston Calling. Am I doing Boston right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, May 26th to 28th at the Harvard Athletic Complex. You have Elena Smorset, the Foo Fighters, Yeah, Yeah, Yes, the Lumineers, mm -hmm. and Paramore. Three-day general admission t passes starting at $359. And children under 10 get in for free. And while you're out Would there... Would you bring children to a music You know, festival? maybe to go see the Foo Fighters, Elena Smorset, maybe. I mean... I think some parents might want to do that. Yeah. I probably would. Probably not toddlers. Yeah, yeah not but toddlers, but I think teens. like 10-year-olds, yeah, maybe 9-year-olds, yeah. yeah. that they enjoy it. It's a great teens. experience. Absolutely. So. And they'll remember for like forever. Get started early. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about the Roots Picnic in Philly. It gets bigger and bigger every year, and they have expanded. I mean, it's not just music anymore. This is my birthday weekend, by the way, so I might oh, go to this oh, nice. It's June 2nd through 4th. Yep. It's at the Mann Center in Philadelphia. Hip-hop and R&B take center stage. Lauryn Hill, Diddy, The Roots, uh, Lil uh, Uzi Vert, Busta Rhymes, Eve, City Girls, and Glow Rilla. Then Dave Chappelle as you mentioned, comedy kicking off the night. So oh, Dave wow. Chappelle will be That's doing so an opening. Two-day general admission tickets are still available at $209. And while you're out there, don't miss the Reading Terminal Market, where you can go and get oh. all the oh, food. Reading Terminal, yes. Reading Terminal, yes. If you're a foodie, yes. Yes. Oh, you're a foodie Reading Terminal Market is where you Ooh, want to go I and love like, that. binge. <laughs> Great chicken. Carmen's famous. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. All the yes. Uh, okay, let, let's uh, head to Tennessee, Bonnaroo. This is, this is Bonnaroo. It's June 15th through 19th, Manchester, Tennessee. Ten stages, more than 100 mm. performers. you got Kendrick Lamar, the food fighters again. They're very busy this summer. Wow. Uh, Cheryl Crow, Lil Nas X, and Big Frida. And Ooh. four day general admission passes starting at $360. And they're still available. They're selling out quickly, but they're still available. Where's that one? Bonnaroo? Uh, Bonnaroo is in Manchester, Tennessee. In Tennessee. And while you're oh. out there, check out for Don't Miss uh, Beans Creek Winery. It's 10 minutes from the festival grounds. Mm. 20 different types of wine. They, and they also do group wine tastings. Nice. Ooh, we should do that. A group yeah. wine tasting. Let me know. Yeah. Sign me up. Sure. I, will, I will come. And you'll bring this outfit. <laughs> and I'll bring this outfit. All right. I'm not going on spring festival. break, so I'm wearing spring break out. There you go. <laughs> like no one, I'm here look. for that. <laughs> All right, Chris, thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll be right back. I like that. You know what, if you can't do it, oh, yeah.
on the third hour today, we're going to catch up with Neil Patrick Harris. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel stars, Tony Shalhoub and Alex Borstein. We will see you tomorrow. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy that weather if you can. Bye. Bye bye. Bye I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! stars of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Tony Shalhoub, and Alex Borstein. And after a few swipes to the right, our girl Bobby hits the dating scene. We'll find out how it's going. And the royal RSVP everyone's been waiting for, Prince Harry will be attending his father's coronation without Meghan. We're talking about it. So it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey, hey, hey. It is a special day. It is Thursday, April the 13th. Why is this day more special than the others around here? Well, it's special to my family. Which means it's special to our That's family. That's true. Yes. To our family because 10 years ago. Oh, geez. I had a baby girl named Mila Hager right there. 10 years ago at this exact time, oh I was God. doing a soul cycle class. Wait, for what you did a soul cycle class on your well, due date? Well, it wasn't my due date. Oh, oh, she oh. She came oh. like uh, almost early. Yeah, her, her due date was like May 10th. Oh, so she came super early. She came early, early and I was doing a soul cycle, and the guy behind me goes, Girl, we're going to have to carry you out like a Trojan horse. <laughs> That's what he said to me, and I'm like, This probably is my last soul cycle class. Yeah. And then it was the, that type of day, just like today, but a little cooler, where yeah, yeah. spring was just you could budding. Feel it, yes. Like you could see the tulips and the daffodils in New York City, and it's that kind of first beautiful I day. I love that. I love where that everybody was out walking. Yeah, and then what it happened? It was a Saturday. Okay. And then um, I wa went to my baby shower. After Soul Cycle. At, after Soul Cycle at a friend's house. Okay. And it was an early afternoon yeah. situation and I was right. sitting down I was next to one of my other best friends yeah. Molly who was also pregnant okay and everybody was staring because we were opening presents which is also hilarious and I felt like my stomach go like boop, boop. and somebody across from me goes girl you're gonna have that baby right now and then it was like three two water, water break. broke yeah at your baby shower. at my baby shower with my sister there and my cousin. So wait, did everyone go into panic mode? Or were, yeah, a what little panic. Yeah, were you? Uh, there was like, it was like laughter plus tears, tears. plus like confusion. <laughs> yeah, what do we do? I went and I took a shower in my friend's shower because uh, Mila was breached. So it was like a real oh. like comedy water break situation. Oh my gosh. Um, and then we just jumped in a cab. I mean, it's so New York like City. New York. It's like, I, I got to get there. And Henry thought we were playing a joke on him because... You Barbara and I, that. yeah, have ganged up on him. Um, so he thought it was like another, it's not, she's not, baby's not due for a month, don't mess with me. Yeah, and then there she was. And my oh. parents, because they never had a grandchild. Oh. Like, Henry, where, what's happening? What? like, they were nervous. Yes, like, what's going on? Anyway, so. Oh. So wait, what are you doing to celebrate? What's we the are um, making Trader Joe's, this is what she wants. Yeah, give it. Trader Joe's um, dumplings. Those are, you love those, you've talked about those. If you haven't had those Trader Joe's yes. dumplings. Yes. 
Okay. They are the best things you've ever tasted. That's her dinner We're choice. We're doing a scavenger hunt. <gasps> Um, because usually, like, she was like, I want you to be there when I open presents and stuff. We're doing a scavenger hunt so that she can open presents and mm. just celebrating. But, like, just it's what's so fun. Thing. No. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I gotta get a cake. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get a cake. I don't yeah, do that. I, we'll do, forgot about that. But yes, oh my God, so it'll what be a really great fun. day. Happy birthday, thank to you, Neela. thank you. All right, so well, there's some big news yesterday out of Buckingham Palace. Everyone's been. We know the, the coronation of the king is happening. Yeah, I still haven't gotten my invitation. How is that possible? So it, it happens. happens. It happens. Yeah, I mean, it means I'm not invited. Okay, great. So anyway, people have been wondering, like, is Prince Harry gonna go? Is his wife Meghan gonna go? Are, Are their, their kids, kids gonna, gonna go? go? It's been the question. The question. Well, part of the well, the question's been answered. So Harry is going. And Megan and the children are not going. So it's that that's the way it kind of shook down. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of drama before, and we we're wondering, like, what does this mean? What is this saying? Yeah. What are they, you know, I know who it's decided? It's so crazy. It's like, you know, anyway, I mean, it, she could just be staying home with the kids because the kids have school. Well, no, it's actually one of the kids' birthday. Oh. The four years old. Yeah, so it, there's a birthday going on, too. So, obviously. But I do think it is, um, when there's a big family event, yeah. whatever it is, a wedding, a, you know, yeah. a funeral, whatever the yes. moment is, um, that's super duper tricky. It really is, because no matter what, and I'm just thinking about it, from experiences I've had, which have been mm -hmm. on a much, yeah, much yeah, smaller yeah. scale than a king's coronation. But when you get back into the old family dynamics, if you've married into the family, you might always a little bit yeah. feel like an outsider. Yeah, and that's natural. Yeah. Yeah, because no matter what, anyone's walked into their in-law's house and been like, everyone's yeah. in the middle of and some great story. And they're joking about maybe and old Christmas yes, past. Yes, and you're just, you just have to yeah, graciously sit there. They said, there was a royal expert who said that uh, that Harry was not, he was going to come in, probably do the event. He's not going to be on the balcony because he's not a working royal. Oh. So he won't be featured there. So he'll come, he'll do what he's supposed to do, and then go back home. All they, in one day? Well, I don't know if it's in one day, but Quick. there's a lot of other stuff that goes on that they were reporting he's not going to take part in. So I don't know that there'll be time for long conversations oh. or whatever, who knows? Yeah, I mean, when you are going to some sort of thing, do you, do you mind going solo? Oh, I don't, I couldn't care less yeah. about a solo go to anything. I'm actually happy to go. Do you so. think Leos are real independent? Yeah. Yeah. Like fiercely. Yeah, you're fiercely I think, independent. And I think you also, you like, I'm not, I don't walk into a room no matter what, not even when I was younger and felt like, oh my God, who am I going to talk to? Yeah. What are they going to think? Because I don't, because you're confident. Well, I think because you just have a... And plus, if the, I think the secret to me, to some of that stuff, is all you have to be is a really good listener. Totally. Because I was at an event once, I remember, with somebody, and he was saying, well, what am I going to say to this one? What am I going to say to this one? I don't know. I'm sitting at the table. How about I say this or this? And I said, well, you don't have to say anything. Yeah. You could ask. Like, if you ask a couple yes. of questions about somebody... By the way... And plus, that's such an, a beautiful wonderful curiosity kind. yes like we've all had those dinner companions we've sat next to who have just bored on I mean, yeah bored a verb <laughs> yeah. bored on about yes. some work which you don't understand yeah but you sit next to somebody that's like well so what do you think about this yeah and then you start a dialogue right. which is about so their life then it's about ideas but to even ask the most basic question yeah like I'm sitting here with you. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Like whoever, maybe the person was some. But can I just ask you, like when yes. you were little, did you? It could be the smallest question. Yes. But I think people enjoy that kind of conversation. Totally. But sometimes it's not about that. So I think going solo is fine if you don't mind, you know, being curious and listening. Yeah. You know, which is actually the most fun, fun thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Okay. Well, there's a new dating dilemma. It's going viral. Uh-oh, what is it? Evidently, on TikTok. <laughs> okay, tell us. So there's a New Yorker, um, Clark Peoples, mm -hmm. and they posted a video explaining a hinge match invited her on a date near his home in Brooklyn. So basically, they met online, and she was like, Where's the, how, where should we go out on a date? Yeah. And he said, how about all the way over by me? So he went to a place near his home. Okay, let's just watch her video, Okay. But even if it was the most beautiful bar in the world, how inconsiderate is it for you to ask a woman to travel so far out of her way to meet you at a place that you literally can see, you could spit on it from the window in your bedroom? That is insane. That, by the way, if you're wondering, is that a big deal? And you might be thinking, maybe it's not. Well, uh, 10 million views and counting because I think people th say, think that's a tell. By you saying, hey, let's go on a date, 
let me go somewhere, and she sees it this way, somewhere really convenient for me mm -hmm. and kind of a hike for you. But there's How a flip to that. How do you feel about this? Um, I think he should have asked her where she wanted to go. But I think she asked him, where should we go? And then he just recommended somewhere right. close to his house. But maybe she could have said, too, that's kind of a yeah. hike for me. How about if we go near me? Yeah. And if he says no, then, then you know. Then the tell. Yeah, because, you know, I think it's also like, you know what you know. Right. Like, you only know a couple restaurants. Chirping chicken. I'm talking about you. <laughs> We're talking about you now. Dagon. Uh, Dagon. Those are my two. Um, no, what was the one, the clam one you used to like? Oh, I love that yeah. place. What was that? <laughs> God, I love that place. Clam. I went there a thousand Wait, what times. what was it called? Uh, clam. Flex muscles. Flex muscles, Flex not muscles. clams. <laughs> you Same dunked family. the crunchy yeah, bread. Yep. You have the best memory. <laughs> yeah, but I've not been there in clam. forever. You love Flex muscles. I love Flex that muscles. That was your favorite and place. And they have donuts that are so yep. higher. You okay, go <laughs> But anyway, my point is, if we go on a date, you recommend those restaurants because but here's that's the, what you know. Here's the truth of it. Sometimes we silently judge. We ask someone a question and they say something and we go, ah. <laughs> it's like all we have to do Speak up. is say, put your boundaries up. Totally. Like, hey. Can we meet in the can, middle? Let's meet in the middle. Or you know what? I, I wouldn't say meet in the middle. I would say let's meet by me. Oh. You want to meet by you? I have an idea. Actually, I've, I've got, a, I got an idea that might work better for me. Yeah. How about if we come by me? Yeah. And if he says, cool. I'm, that took the pressure off me to pick. Totally. I don't know. Then great. But I think we, we, how many times have you been secretly mad at someone and you don't tell them and they're like, they don't totally. even know. He's probably watching this going, was that me? Oh God. <laughs> I, I just said, come over. Yeah, I just like this restaurant I in Brooklyn. I just like this restaurant. Okay. Oh, we're going to love this, guys. Coming up next, we are going to talk dating with our girl, Bobby oh, Thomas. Yeah, she's got some great news to share. Oh. Right after this. Oh. We love her so much. We are back with one of our dearest today, mm. style editor Bobby Thomas, who is dipping her toe back into the dating game after more than a decade. And she is bringing us all <laughs> along for the ride in hopes that it'll encourage other people out there. So, Bobby, yeah. we've been kind of wondering <laughs> how things are going. We didn't want to ask. I say, at the top, I love this family. Yeah. Like Kelsey and Talia and everybody, there's been this nudge to, like, yeah. come on, step out. And so many of you have... Yeah commented and shared DMs, which and is why doing, the diary is up. Yeah, so you're doing something really cool. You've, you're gonna kind of chronicle yeah. your dating time yeah. in hopes that other people kind of have that that <gasps> hand to hold and yes. that bravery to get back out there. So inspired by everything. So I said, okay, let me put all the feelings and thoughts in that because we never have enough time. But totally. it's live and it's up. And yes, the apps, it is the wild west. I mean, there are stories I can't share, yeah. but I can tell you the voice prompt on Hinge got me. Wait, I, what does that mean? Exactly. Tell us. So there's, I'm showing the ladies. I can't show you at home, but I did get permission. Oh, can you play yeah. voice? This, um, oh, where's my microphone? You can. So okay. that's yours. I'd obviously like somebody that uh, loves fries and surfing, but to be honest, if you are just happy, you bring energy into the room and you're ready to squeeze every last drop out of life, mm -hmm. I would like to meet you. Wait, can Wait, we introduce what? him to Huda? <laughs> Are you still dating him? <laughs> um, wow, this this guy. Wow. Um, okay, so that unbelievable. guy. Unbelievable. Yeah. The apps. There's yes. a lot of feels, and yes. I have to tell you guys, that's what I said I wanted. I cannot believe I could even feel again. Yeah. And to have all these feelings and 
it's been wild, and I and I did go on my first date. Okay, was so that who you went on your first date? No, with? somebody else. Okay, I'm gonna talk about it all. If I didn't, I went on my first date, and it was everything I asked for. He was so nice, and so nice. Yeah. But nice wasn't enough. I sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, I asked for this super fine. But the next day I talk about all my feelings in the diary and it, I realized like I couldn't stop thinking about a platonic meetup that randomly came through my in-laws. It was another widow who had lost his wife a month after Michael. Okay. Um, his name is Michael. Okay. And he has a daughter. Yeah. And we got together and it was this... Uh, it took me a minute to realize, oh my gosh, the shorthand. And then I secretly was like hoping he would ask me to dinner and not to get the kids together again. Yeah. And so he asked to get the kids together again. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh, you know. Yeah. But then I missed the second text and I screamed because yeah. he asked me to dinner. And we went to dinner and it was really great. Oh. And I feel like a schoolgirl because <laughs> I um, I had such a nice time and I was thinking about him, but it's it's. It's scary to even just feel this stuff again. So by putting yourself out yeah. into the world, this other random yes. person came to you so bec because random. he had seen, not on the app, but because he had seen what was and going not even, on here. Not even him. This woman watched the show. Oh. She, her husband was a patient of my father-in-law and his father or something. There, there was some connection. She reached out. He didn't know this, but it was so, but so I, strange how I the universe. I, yeah, I think yes. you putting yourself in the world Be made open. that made that. Any of your friends, yeah. just hearing that you're ready and seeing you. I think it was the action of like I'm going on the app. So if you tell people, you know. I'm interested. I want to go out so, to sort of be social. So People is this the know. beginning? I mean, I don't. We don't want to pry, but we're happy that you. <laughs> so nice. We're like we kind of <laughs> feel like your mom. I know. <laughs> and I'm going. I promise. There's a post going up tomorrow on the diary where I'm going to share more about a lot that people are talking about. Yes, we've been on more than a few dates. I'm super nervous. I. Um, yeah, I'm trying to like just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. There's also like. It's backwards. When you're younger, you think somebody's cute, you hook up, and then you get to know them. Yeah, and yeah. now it's kind of like, here I am. I'm a lot. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> you're wow. amazing is what you are. You are magnificent. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Bobby, we're so happy. I can't wait to read the diary. I know. <laughs> get I'm like, where is the diary? <laughs> Today.com <laughs> slash Bobby's <laughs> love. Yeah. All right. We love we'll you. And you'll, next week. You will. And, good. Yes. Good, good. We want yes. to know more. All right. Coming up next, a couple of marvelous stars, Emmy winners, Tony Shalhoub and Alex Borstein. Yeah, they're going to tell us what's Look at for the final season of Mrs. Maisel right after this. Coming up tomorrow, we sit down with a legendary trailblazer, Dr. Jane Goodall. Plus, actress and singer Vanessa Hudgens on her new movie and her engagement. And rain, rain, go away. We've got the essentials to keep you dry all day. It's all Friday on Hoda and Jenna. To two of the funniest people on TV, Tony Shaloub and Alex Bernstein, both. Bernstein. 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 <laughs> but I got. Did I get Tony's name right? <laughs> My name's the one that usually. Bernstein. I'm sorry. It's okay. Do you Jana? know what? <laughs> <laughs> I 
did that just to set you up. Okay. Thank they you. both scored <laughs> Emmy wins for their roles in the hit series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And now it's almost time to say goodbye Why? because it is okay. the 50s housewife turned stand up comic Midge Maisel. Tony plays Midge's dad, Alex plays her manager, and we've got a sneak peek at the final season. Take a look. Why didn't you ever mention Ethan's aptitude test? His what? His aptitude test. They give every child in his school an aptitude test at the beginning of the year. Oh, how'd he do? He failed. They say he has the potential for nothing but happiness. Is that bad? Ethan is a firstborn Weissman male. A firstborn Weissman male is expected to excel. They are not expected to be happy. I'm sorry, just because he's happy doesn't mean he won't excel. Of course it does. Not one person who's ever accomplished anything of worth in life has ever been happy. <laughs> <laughs> you got a point. Got a point. Hi, guys. Hi. Our two Hi. Emmy winners sitting here with us today I know, from where this are, wonderful show. Where are your Emmys? Can we ask? Uh, my parents have uh, an Emmy, and they have it displayed, and mine is, like, in a box. In a box? In a box. Yeah, in a box. You can't let that stuff, you know, you're, when you're home, you're parenting, you're wiping up <laughs> bottoms, you're cleaning up things. You <laughs> yeah, can't, you can't let you can't that, let that get to your head. head. But Tony, where's yours? Well, which one? Oh! oh. Yeah, drop it! Yes. Drop yes, it! King. Uh, drop well, it! I actually <laughs> had them, uh, you know, like strewn around the house for a while, but then I eventually, uh, through a good friend of mine, advice, I, I sent them all to, like, a, a historical society in Wisconsin, which is where I'm from. Oh. So if they're at, like, this kind of uh, Wisconsin... Oh, so people can like, enjoy them? They'll be in, like, a display what case. What do you think about that, Al? Wow. I'm kind about? of jealous. No one, <laughs> no one cares about me in, in Deerfield, now, Illinois. A, a lot of people were saying at the end of this, this is, this is obviously sad for the viewers, but for you guys who've become a family, and I wondered who was going to be the one who was going to have the, the most difficult time at the end. We heard there was a bet, actually. There was a bet, and yeah. I cracked first. I actually yeah. cried, which is... You know, no one's supposed to know I had a heart. <laughs> yeah. She's had all, for five years this sort of tough veneer, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, then she crumbled. What did the end mean for you, Alex? I mean, honestly, that day it was just a massive lump in my throat. And you're, 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 it's like being present at your own funeral. Oh, you're yeah. like throwing a little bit of dirt on a piece of yourself. And it is painful. It's a breakup. It is yeah. a, a, a death. It's You're grieving. Yeah. But then... You have this incredible like premiere. We're going to get to kind of be, come alive again. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like uh... Tony. This show really struck a chord. Yeah. I mean, people have loved it. So it must be kind of interesting. I mean, y'all are doing this crazy thing on Fifth Avenue tomorrow. Yeah. You know, people are so fond of it. Mm -hmm. It must be sort of weird to have this parallel sadness. Mm -hmm. Like the viewers are sad it's over, mm -hmm. and you as a family are probably sad too. We are. We really are. You have two daughters. Was it like giving your daughters away at a wedding? Yeah, exactly <laughs> like. That's what it, I yes. feel like that's what it yeah. might feel like, like, where it's you're so happy and you're so joyous and it's so beautiful and yet you're saying goodbye and you're letting go and it's yeah. high and getting it emotional. I can, it yeah. gets like, really hard. That's, well, that's so true. And it's also because I think, Alex, your character, Susie, was based on not just what was in your head but what your, where your families yeah, come yeah. from. Oh, you yeah. poured it all in there. Tell yeah. us oh, yeah. how Susie much of... Susie is my grandmother. Susie, both of my grandmothers. Susie is my mom. You know, all of people talk about the 50s show and the housewife, and I never experienced that. Like, yeah. my grandmothers both worked their butts off. My mother worked. Everyone, there she is. Aw, oh. I miss her. Um, that's my mother. Oh, Lord. Oh. Uh, yeah, just really strong women. What women kind of jobs who, did they have? Well, my grandmother survived the Holocaust, mm -hmm. came to the U.S., and she immediately started working sewing wigs. Wow. It was a wig sewer. Wow. And this is one of them right here. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And my other grandmother yeah. was Orthodox Jewish, and they had a little shop, and she swung chickens over her head. Wow. To make them kosher. Wow. Wow, that's a very interesting <laughs> and specific job. Yeah, Google it. Um, you know what's so great is that both of you have some really fun projects ahead, too. Yes. And I feel like sometimes when you say goodbye to something, you need something on the horizon yeah. to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. You're, first of all, we didn't know you could sing. Oh, Every, wow. yeah. So you're going to be in a musical special, which we're really looking forward to. On, uh, tell us about it. Yes, it drops. That's what the kids say. It drops on April 18th. It is also on Amazon Prime Video. And it is, uh, it's called Corsets and Clown Suits. <laughs> and I like to describe it as kind of a filthy <laughs> TED Talk with music. <laughs> <laughs> a filthy TED Talk with music? Yeah. What kind of music do you like singing? 
Uh, oh, God, everything. Everything? In the show, we do some covers. There's some 80s nostalgia. There's mm. there's some Bowie. Uh, wow. There's some interesting medleys. And there's a lot of original music, a lot of comedic original songs. It's like a deeply personal wildly fictitious <laughs> journey of my life post-divorce. Wow. Oh, I want to see that. Yeah, we've no, got to watch it. Yeah, of course, it's in clown Tony, suits. Yeah. And Tony Monk yeah. is coming yes. back as a movie. Yes, a st movie for streaming on Peacock. So We're going to start shooting that next month. And... Uh, be nice. After 14 years, we wrap that's, that. Is that, is that like you were OCD then? So is it like post-pandemic? What's it going is, well, on for in the, this? For the character, it yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, revisiting <laughs> like this. Like, uh, me. Not you. We know <laughs> you I am too. Um, but yeah, Monk, uh, having gone through uh, the pandemic, and we find him in not good shape. Wow. Oh, no. But wait, that was 14 years after? So maybe 14 years from now, we'll be doing a Maisel movie. Wait, that, oh. hey, let's put it into the universe, but does it have to before, take 14 no, we years? Don't, we want it before no. then. Yeah, we'll be dead. We heard yeah. there's actually, there's a rumor that y'all are, <laughs> there's a rumor y'all are doing a musical. A musical, yeah. Is that how, no. this is how rumors get started. But that, you start I actually it. started that rumor. I, I'd like to take credit for it. But they asked me on one of the carpets, what would you like to do, a spin off of this? And I go, oh, you know, I'd love to do a musical. And then the next day it's like, Borstein, penning musical for <laughs> Maisel. And that's how it starts. I guess. That's how it you yeah. know, Oprah says to put it in the universe, so let's do it. We're putting it. Let's All right, guys. I'd also like a new car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. The fifth and final season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel premieres tomorrow on Prime Video. And you can also check out Alex's musical comedy special, Corsets and Clown Suits. It's the world's best name. It's on Prime Video next Tuesday. How about a nasty TED Talk? I love that. Yeah, I love that with whole... Music. With music. Yeah, don't watch it with your kids. Okay. <laughs> up next, a quintessential New Orleans dish to get us pumped up for our trip to the Big Easy. Coming up right <laughs> after this. In just about two weeks, we are headed to New Orleans for the world-famous Jazz Fest, and we cannot wait to chow down on all the great cuisine. And that's 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 come on, Alon. What I mean about it, and yeah. here to make one of the city's most famous dishes is Alon Shea. She, he's the chef owner of Saba and Miss River Restaurants. Alon, we went to Miss River when we were there last time. By the way, yeah. we loved it. And, and I said your last name wrong, Shia. Shia. It's okay. okay. And, the, and your daughter. I'm having one of those days. Okay, she baby. stole your saltine. She stole yeah. the show. She your stole daughter's the show. amazing. Yeah. Little Ruthie. Little yeah. Is she going to come join us to, to dine again, we hope? She will. Okay, okay. Yep, she's waiting so for you. So, a muffalata. A muffalata, the quintessential Italian Sicilian New Orleans sandwich. It, absolutely. Okay. Invented in the early 1900s. Look how beautiful it is. I mean, what, is, what's in it, like, what makes it a muffalata? So, there's many things that make it a muffaletta. One is olive salad, which we're gonna make. And I'm you dicing some uh, You're such a chopper. Dicing some you? onions. Can I ask a question? Why didn't you just throw it in whole? Well, because I like to kind of give it a head start. Oh, you know? okay. like, what so happens that if you hold it and put it in whole? Well, Will it, it might not blend up the right way. Okay. Yeah, but we still have some more things to put in there. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna add some what you got? pickles. Sweet so we have, or or, or uh, these are sweet pickles. Okay, I love sweet. We I have sweet. olives. We have roasted peppers. Some pepperoncini. Garlic. Capers and Sicilian oregano. Sicilian. And we're gonna wait. What, what, there's more. There's more to go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. And then Jenna, onions. Do you want to I mean, zest a little lemon? I just in called this an onion. I've lost it. And Is it almost Friday? Pour in some olive oil. 
Risk. Some vinegar. This is rice yeah. wine vinegar or it's a red wine red vinegar. Wine. We have hot sauce. Hot you're sauce. Doing great. Girl. Yeah, you're what like is... a natural zester. I don't think so. You, have, you have the zest. That's anchovy paste, which mm. gives it a little kick. How now, much might... zest do you need to put in there? Like as much as you want. I mean, a lemon's worth is good, but so that's whole... good too. Wait, what are we making? What is all this that we're this putting in here? This is going to be the olive salad. Olive salad. And that's going to be a spread that goes okay. onto the sandwich. So let's close Not this bad so boy. Not so easy, up. is it? Let's, okay. Well, yeah, you see, I haven't used you... one of these before. Okay. Well, you know, okay. imagine that, like, turning on. Being okay. plugged and, in. And, yeah, being and, plugged in. It's, it's okay, it's okay. And that, we just we know and what that, happens. And that goes all around and makes this delicious olive salad. Ooh, oh, look at like it. That. So that's all of these things. Look at that bread. Look yes. at that bread. Now, is a this the key? Yes, that's it. has it. to be the size of a hubcap. How do you Dude, find bread not. this big? Well, I brought it from yeah. New Orleans. Go to New Orleans and you get it. I brought it on the plane with me. Yeah, and everyone Do you toast it? Oh yeah, we're gonna toast it. So I'm cutting this in half. Yeah. We're gonna open it up, mm -hmm. and we're gonna look put. At that. We're gonna put all of this olive salad look at, on look one what's side. Happening. Look at this. Look at this. Spread all that around. Push it around. Imagine all that flavor happening. Yes. Mm. We're gonna drizzle some extra virgin mm. olive oil all over. Oh, look like at a it. Lot of Soaking it. it. Some jardiniera, some like pickled vegetables. We don't know pickled what jardiniera. Pickled it's, vegetables. Yeah, it's like pickled vegetables, and Can we're gonna you... put some provolone cheese. Yes. I like putting like sharp and what, not sharp. Is this mortadella? Probably. What is this? So that's salami. Salami. Yeah, we could just load it up. On this just, side? Yeah, on that side. This side. Yep. This load is the meat up. side. Salami, mortadella. Oh, I love mortadella. Copa. Does mortadella have uh, um, olives in it? it what is no, that? No, it has green? pistachios. Oh, pistachios. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. and, then, and then copa, which is like a cured this, pork shoulder. This is a shoulder. lot of meat. Uh, there's it's always a lot. a lot of meat and a lot of cheese. There's a lot of meat okay. and a lot of cheese. Okay. And then we're going to take this, we're going to put it in the oven. Oh. Ooh. And we're gonna toast it some like this. Don't, don't even don't make it a sandwich. No, no. Leave it like Leave that. Leave it open. Leave yep. it open. And some people don't toast their muffaladas. How could you not? I think is like a it's sin. A, it's a sin. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So after it toasts, oh. it's gonna get all melty and delicious. Oh, and Ooh, look, look, at look at this that. boy. Oh, look wait, wow. when did you put it back together? Well, um, you weren't looking, but okay. I just, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay. There's a there's a whole halfway here. through you put it. You yeah. Put so when when it when it toasts, you then take it out of the oven. You put it back. together. Okay, got it. And then you have this big, beautiful mm. sandwich with all the melty cheese mm. and the olive salad mm. and all the meats. It's really, I think, one of the mm. best sandwiches in the world. It's and delicious. we serve it at Miss River this at the one. Four Seasons in New Orleans. Do you this one's serve this one? We serve this one right here. This one. Y'all yep. yep. gotta get mm. to see Alon mm. at Miss River. It's delicious. Alon, thank you. Thank Yummy. you guys. Get this recipe. Thanks Go to today.com slash food. Coming up next, lifted eye, smoother skin. We've got mm. makeup trips mm. for, and tick tricks that the pros use right after this. Okay, that's delicious. So good. Okay, recently we put out a call where we asked you if you had any makeup questions for the pros. And of course you delivered. Today we have three viewers who are getting their beauty questions answered by celebrity makeup artist Ashley Glazer. Hi, uh, Ashley. Hi. Ashley, people need your knowledge. So our first viewer <laughs> is Raquel from Jackson, New Jersey. Let's hey, hear what her question is. 
My name is Raquel, and I want to achieve getting a smooth-looking skin. My question is, how do I minimize the look of pores and get a flawless finish on my foundation? Thank you. Okay. okay, that's a question that a lot a of million women people want to have. That. Okay, minimize pores. So what okay. do you do? So pores, really minimizing them, depending on like the level of pores yeah. that you have. It starts sure. with skincare. You want to use a toner, lightweight mm -hmm. moisturizer, but to get like an instant effect with your makeup. If you have really smooth, like sort of shallow pores, mm -hmm. like Raquel does, you can use like a blurring balm. Just because you have the texture doesn't mean you need to be super matte. So it doesn't need to be a powder. You can use something like this. You so you still look like after skin. the makeup. Or or before? Before, during, and after. Okay. So this is something you can keep during the day as well. Okay. And then if you're a little deeper, like you have like some scarring mm -hmm. or like a pock mark, you can use something that's almost like a putty. What's and that And you can called? just like pore. dab it. This is a pore um, refiner. This is the pore professional. So it's a little bit thicker, like a sculpting yeah. putty, and you can just pack and it, it right on. And it that kind of creamy. And it evens out the surface. What do we think, Raquel? I like it. And oh. also, Raquel, you have beautiful yes, skin. Yes, do. <laughs> she okay. does. And they, it comes in different uh, Comes in different tones. colors, different skin tones, or universal, which is clear. That's awesome. Okay. Okay, our next viewer, hi, is Amanda from Harlem, New York. Let's see what she wants answered. My name is Amanda, and I am the maid of honor for my best friend's wedding this fall. I'm kind of a novice when it comes to makeup, so I'm very interested in getting some tips and tricks to give me a very professional, glam look that'll last me all night. Okay, so Ashley, what should she do? Okay, so if you're doing your own makeup at your friend's wedding, and this works for anybody going to an event, you wanna make sure that your makeup bag is like fully stacked with all the goodies that us professionals use. Okay. So primers, setting sprays, curler, lip liners, like don't cut any corners. And it's really about like intentional layering. So a lot of people will, I'll hear, I hear it all the time. Oh, I need more for pictures, right? Like more of the same color right. that I use every day. Oh. So you wanna make sure that you're using sheer layers. So this for them, Putting on now is a cream blush in a similar yeah, skin too. tone, like a blush um, peachy mm. tone. Look and then we're gonna put on, look, Amanda. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Then we're gonna put on a peachy tone powder. So we're oh, layering the cream it. and the powder so it stays on all day. It supports the blush as you're giving kisses on the cheeks and you're hanging out. And then you don't have to feel like you're wearing too much makeup, but it looks good in pictures and in person. You know what else you did with her? Which is yeah. her eyes look oh, gorgeous. She's gorgeous. She Beautiful is gorgeous, eyes. but smoky. <laughs> when is yes. the wedding? Uh, September, end of September. I wish it was oh. today. You could just walk out <laughs> right now. What are you going to do now? You need to go out for drinks. No, I'm getting my passport <laughs> oh, photo perfect. taken. Oh, good, yes. Good, good idea. Perfect. perfect. <laughs> um, Thanks, Ash. All right. So our last viewer is Denise from Park Ridge, New Jersey. Let's check out her question. My name is Denise, and this year I'm turning 60. I'm starting to notice that the skin around my eyes is changing, and people have been saying I look tired, even though I've had a full night's sleep. The way I've been doing my makeup really isn't working for me anymore. Can you guys teach me the best way to do my makeup to compensate for my droopy eyelids? I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, first, we're mad at you. Yeah, Denise, okay. you're gorgeous. <laughs> yes, we're really already mad. Okay, so let's start there. So if we want to get rid of what she's calling her droopy yeah. eyelids. Which is just beautiful yeah. eyes. How do we do that? So, yes, Denise is yeah. gorgeous. So you want to make sure you don't want to forget about your eyebrows when yeah. you feel like your eyes are turning down and as, as we mature in life. So you can see this one's a little bit fuller. I'm just going to have you turn towards me just a little bit. You want to make sure that when you're ending your brow, especially if your eye tends to lean downwards, is that you're ending the brow in line with the tip of your ear. Oh. Okay. So it shouldn't be going downwards. Down. It shouldn't oh. be going straight down because it's like the art of illusion. So everything should go smooth and flat okay. out. Then you can use like a concealer, a lighter shade than what you would normally use maybe something you'd put like under eyes to highlight as like a brow lift. Uh, wow. And you oh, can do it top. up on top. And you can use like a tiny eyeshadow brush to do this um, or your finger. So it acts as like it's literally pulling Lifting. from under. Okay. And then when you do your eyeshadow, you want to make sure you blend like your matte tone, like your contour color right a little bit higher onto the lid, especially if you have a heavier mm -hmm. um, brow bone. And then when you use a shimmer, don't Where's be afraid of shimmer. You yeah. want to put it straight up like from your Let's pupil. See. Close. So just use your pupil as yeah. your guide and you go straight up <laughs> to, to the arch of yeah. the eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can see a little bit of a lift and you would use this in like a lighter tone in your palette. Yeah. That's like a highlighting color. Awesome. Oh my gosh. That was That's great. so good. Thank you, Wow, Ashley. thank you guys. Thanks so much. Coming up next, it's time for our spring fling. Okay, find out if one of our friends scores two tickets to a dream vacation right after this. Yeah. <laughs>
We love this part of the show. Time for our spring fling getaway. So we plucked one lucky fan off the plaza, and we're playing a game that may score her an epic vacation. Okay, Hoda, may I introduce you to a super fan, but also a <laughs> lovely, lovely person. Her name is Sarah Joseph. She is from Dallas. She is a junior at the University of Texas at Dallas. That's right. Go yeah. Horns! <laughs> okay, this is how it's gonna work. You ready? Uh, yes. By the right. way, your friend slept in? She slept in. And you came here? And I came here. <laughs> Maybe you don't take her on vacation. Okay, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna have 30 seconds to stand behind that red line, okay. toss as many of these colorful cubes onto these poles okay. as possible, but here's the deal. The floor is going to spin. And what happens, girl, at the end of this, after 30 seconds, we're going to count out how many tubes you got on those poles. And if you get one tube, we'll get you'll get number one, number two, three, four, and five. And the prizes get better as we mosey on okay. down. Okay, let's step over <laughs> let's here. Let's do it. Let's step over here. If you just stand behind there, okay. put 30 seconds on the clock. Come on, girl. You ready, Sarah? I'm ready. I'm let's ready. Let's go. All right. Go, Sarah. Oh, so Come on, girl. girl. Oh my God. You got it, you got it. Take your time, take your time. You got it. What? Oh, no, not yet. You got it, you got it. No, come no, on, no, no, it's okay. Come you on, come on. Time. You've got time, you've got time. Yeah. The, okay. the timer's all messed up. The clock's not working. Uh, okay, that's okay. Keep then, going. You know what? Let's just do it. It's a short one. Take your time, relax, relax, yeah. relax. Yeah, now go. The clock's broken, so try again. Oh, okay. Jenna, help, help, Jenna. Help, help. Jenna's gonna help. <laughs> yeah! Yes! Try okay. to get two. You, you, you got it. Underhand, Jenna. underhand, Jenna. underhand. Jenna. underhand. Jenna, one more, one more, one more, one more. No, oh, okay. One more, one more. One last one. Okay, you got it. Under this him. is it. Oh, okay, that's okay. all right. That's all right. Guess what? You that's still what, got by a prize. You know what? Teamwork <laughs> makes Teamwork. the dream work. Yes. That's, we were going to let you kids. go home empty-handed. You know what? One is wonderful. That's what we call one. <laughs> would you like to know where you're going? I would love to know where I'm going. Drum roll, please. You are going to Punta Cana <laughs> in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> wow. This is a good one. Let's find out more about the trip. Oh my goodness. Thanks to Apple Vacations, you're getting a three night stay at the Ryu Palace Punta Cana. <laughs> there, you and a guest can enjoy tropical gardens, a beautiful beach, and a wide what? variety of dining options and amenities. <laughs> Airfare is included with this trip, so pack your bags and enjoy. Oh, yeah! <laughs> you're going to Punta Cana, this one of the so most beautiful much. places on earth. Oh my gosh, I'm we so excited. Where are you going to take your friend who's sleepy? Probably my family and my friends. Okay, you, okay. Get, to take, you <laughs> one, get to take one person, person on the house. So you'll mm. think about it. I'll think about think it. About yeah, it. Totally. I'll Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was it. fun. Okay, and we'll be back right after this. Punta Cana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to Punta Cana. Oh, my God. Thank, thank you so much. Tomorrow, scientist and activist Dr. Jane Goodall. Oh, it's a dream come true. We love her so. Plus, the newly engaged Vanessa Hudgens. And Michelle Collins weighs in on the hottest trends. Y'all, today is Thursday, which means tomorrow is Friday. Join Hoda Kotb for season three of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. When we do our show, we're inviting someone to come in. We are informing you, showing the world has multiple sides and beautiful sides. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it!
Savannah, you got to catch up with one of probably your most favorite people, Miss mm. Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, she's a legend. You yeah. know, she was just down the street. She met us at historic St. Patrick's Cathedral. Honestly, we could have talked for hours. Kristen, of course, needs no introduction. She's a Tony and Emmy winner and has transformed Broadway with her starring roles in Wicked and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Yeah. Well, she credits God and her faith with helping her get to the main stage. And as a Christian, she believes it's her mission to share God's love. And whether that is on the Broadway stage or walking down the streets of New York, she's finding a different kind of voice. I can't believe we're here. Can you believe we're here? You got your start singing in church. I did. Not a church like this one, though. Oh, no, no. Uh, mine was in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and it only had about 1,000 people in, in membership. But God was a huge part of my life. How I found my gift was through church music. What does it feel like to sing a great hymn, like How Great Thou Art, and be able to sing it like you? I feel, <laughs> thank you so much for making me cry. It's, it gets me back to my roots. Whenever I sing, you mentioned Great Is Thy Faithfulness earlier, and I, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, I guess the echo. Morning by morning, morning new, new mercies I see. Take my mic down. <laughs> Never. You have a song in your heart, and you should sing it. Maybe not as loud as me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not as loud as you. I'll lip sync. Would you say you first found your voice in yeah. church? I was in the choir, little kids' choir, and my, they were having an audition for an adult solo. And my mom said, you can't, you're a kid. I said, let me just go try out. You know, that says a lot about me at that age. So I went and I got the solo. They were like, we're gonna give it to you. And then that Sunday I sing the solo and the church erupts. And I say this story only to tell you that when you're a little kid and the encouragement you get from people that love mm. you to follow the passion that you love, I was given an opportunity to sing about something that I believe in, which is faith. Mm and do it in front of people who love me, a very safe space. It started the ball rolling. And I love to sing for all kinds of faiths because I believe that we, we worship a God that is loving, not one that is man has made so, you're going to hell, mm. and a loving God. And if I can spread that joy, then I'm gonna try because that was one of the things God told me when I was a little girl. People go, oh, he actually, he spoke, hey, Chris, you know? Yeah. I get these impressions on my heart. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a still, small voice. And when I get that impression, it's like a handprint, like, yes, that's correct. It's interesting about God's voice because um, it's hard to describe, although actually I think you describe it really well. Thank you. But I often find it is saying something that is unexpected. Yes, yes. I remember Savannah even talking about my adoption. And I've just started talking about it recently because, because I got the impression in my heart, this will help other people. People need to know that you just weren't in, in this world magically. They need to know what was behind it. It will inspire people. And so it's become a lot more easier for me to talk about, but if I couldn't listen, I would have kept that secret, and I'm not ashamed of it. Kristen was adopted as a newborn. Her adoptive mother happened to be in the hospital the same day she was born for an operation that would leave her unable to conceive. By chance or heavenly plan, Kristen unexpectedly became available for adoption. She said to the doctor, I always wanted to try for a little girl and now I won't be able to. And he remembered that story. So when my birth mom, Mama Lynn, came to give birth, she, they called my dad before and said, do you want to surprise Junie tomorrow? Because I've got a little baby here that's going to need a home. And my dad said, yeah. And so they kind of took my mom, robed her up and day of her surgery and took her down to the babies. And they said, see that baby? That's your baby. So she's waiting on you when you get done. And so we went home together. And she said, I always felt like I had you because we went home together. And I mean, how can I, me personally, not believe in miracles? Mm. I got the perfect family. I was brought into this world by the wonderful mother, Mama Lynn, and I was able to get an education. I grew up in a loving, giving family, one full of faith and a lot of fun too. And 
you know, it's a gift. It's a gift. So that's a miracle. But how does Mama Lynn, did she sing? Yes. Okay. And the, my birth father was a great musician as well, mm -hmm. Billy Etheridge. And some people might know who he is out there, but so I know where it came from. Mm -hmm. And she's petite. I got her height. People say nature versus nur mm -hmm. nurture. I think no, nature and nurture mm -hmm. is what it is. It's such a beautiful alchemy, this story. You know, it's yeah. like this magic. It's divine. It's divine. It's divine. You've had ups and downs in your career. You've talked about how you've looked for God's voice yeah. to guide you. Yeah. How has that helped you make decisions that might have been a little surprising at the time, or a little yeah. unorthodox or off the beaten path? It's been really interesting because I have a a wonderful team that works for me to help me guide with these decisions. Even when I was younger, I was lucky enough to get a great agent. I went to New York with my friend Denny to help him audition and get settled in. And I thought, maybe I'll just try out for something for fun, have the experience. And I ended up getting this part. And I had a big decision to make. And this is where I talk about the gut. This is where I talk about that impression. Some people call it the universe. That's fine. For me, it's the Lord. But I have to get quiet. My whole life I've heard from my aunts and my mom, two ears, one mouth, Kristen. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> Speak less and listen more, because you know I can talk. <laughs> and when I do that, I'm able to kind of hear what God wants from me. And I went to New York. I said, I want to do this thing, and it worked out. So God has other plans sometimes, and it's happened several times in my career. But faith is a journey, and not always an easy one. Along with great success, Kristen has had great setbacks, including an onset accident that nearly killed her a decade ago. Severely injured, the road back was a crucible. It was horrific and scary and awful. Now, I could go in the path of bitterness and anger, and I did for a while, I did. But I could let all that go. It happened. So guess what I'm gonna choose? That way. And a lot of it is up to us. He gave us a mind and for me to just, I don't guess I'm preaching, but for me to talk about that, that'll be something I really want people to know. Have you ever had doubt, seasons of doubt or disconnection with God? Yes. The big question of why God me? Yeah. Why me, God? I've had several injuries. You know, I'm in a, I'd like to say I'm an athlete. All my Broadway people know what I mean. People that tour, they know what I mean. I asked my mom one day, this was after this accident. I had to kind of relearn how to get some of my sentences out, land the plane, so to speak. I, my physical, physical body is not the same as it was. And I had a big pity party. And they, were, they stayed with me for three months to help me walk and things. She said, why not you? I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm crying. She goes, of course, do I want this for my daughter? No, but why not you? You know better or worse than anybody else. Things happen to everybody. 
you're on a mission to spread the love of God. I mean, that's it. Wait, that's you know, but also when you do fall and you mess up and we all have, you get this amazing gift, which is God's grace. It's an incredibly bonding experience with God. When you know you did something wrong and you feel that on your heart, you are forgiven. I mean, you're so right to bring that up, grace. Growing up, my mom always said, Junie, channel with I love you. She said, uh, if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> That's hard. It's hard. And it's later in life because I'm a Leo and I'm very loyal and I expect it back by people that love me. And when I've been hurt in the past, I have held on to it and it has hurt me. So just recently, this is a, a fact, I've started forgiving people that I feel have hurt me that don't even care anymore or know about it because <laughs> I'm the one that's hurting and that's God's grace. He says, see my child, if you'd done this the whole time, you wouldn't have carried that, that on your journey. I think that's so unique to God's character, if you will. When he tells us something, even something we don't really want to do, like forgive someone who hurt you. Yeah. He's not doing it for them. He's doing it for you. Yeah, it's true. And I've had tro more trouble, Savannah, learning to forgive myself mm. when I have disappointed others, disappointed myself. Mm. I'm very hard on myself. Type A, your average nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Learning to forgive yourself is the most important so that you can move forward. At my church, the pastor says, one way to define sin is just the way we fall short of love. Oh my gosh, say that again. Sin is just the way that we fall short of love. And I think that's a more accurate way to describe it yes. and more matches up with what, you know, what God intends. I agree. I so agree. I love that. I'm gonna remember that in my head because it is all about love, isn't it? Yeah, we don't have these conversations all that much. Not anymore. And there's a way to talk about it, I think, in love and openness without judgment or some kind of, I don't know. Cutting think, off, Yeah. closing down the wall. And you know what it comes down to? We're all God's children. I know. Everybody gets in on it. It's, it's, I think if we thought about that more, yeah. it would be transforming. Then we really would be look at each other as brother and sister instead yes. of the enemy. In this family together. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what God wants us to do. Don't you, Savannah? On this road. So on this day, Kristen Chenoweth, who God gave the voice of an angel, raised hers loud and strong, and we were blessed.
uh, waiting for us. Well, that was very thoughtful yeah. of you. And I bought out the restaurant. So. <laughs> so we could have a really private conversation. Exactly. Yeah. With another glitzy award season behind her, Michelle Williams is happy to be back home in New York. You've been a New Yorker for a long time. Something about this place, I just can't really imagine ever leaving it. The 42-year-old is fresh off of a fifth career Oscar nomination for her starring role in The Fablements, a semi-autobiographical film about Steven Spielberg's childhood, in which she plays the director's mother, Mitzi. You do what your heart says you have to, so you don't owe anyone your life. Did you feel it in the moment when you were making it that this is something special? Well, it felt special to me. I mean, the moment that I read the script and just saw, like, this gorgeous, gorgeous story with these, like, big, beautiful scenes and the enormity of Stephen's heart and his life experience with the collaboration between himself and Tony Kushner on this, uh, on the dialogue, I knew it was really special. I mean, it was just, like, the most gorgeous script ever. So um, I had a sense of what it could be, and then like, and then the work begins, and then it's the like, okay, how do I live up to that? My 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 strongest feeling was, all right, this thing like the script is so beautiful, it's it's flawless, it exists. You just have to jump up and be able to meet it. Like you just have to like, it's a high bar, and you have to hope you can jump jump up and catch it. Mm. Did you feel any? relationship to Mitzi as a mother of three yourself, like, I hope to be this way for my kids. I served watching, oh, yeah. I served had yeah. some of that, like, am I like that? I want to be that way, you know? Did you feel any of that as a mother? I still think about, like, the spirit of Mitzi as a mother. I still think about, you know, she, she raised four children, and all four of them adore her. And she gave them what children really want, which is attention and the ability to play. It was very poignant to read and to see how strongly Stephen felt. For obvious reasons, it was a story yeah. sort of about his family, and that when he saw you first as Mitzi, he just broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. Did that feel like a responsibility to Stephen to get that right, because you're sort of carrying his family story along? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I, you know, that first day when, I, when he broke down, um, I, my heart went out to him and I wanted to offer him comfort and inside I'm thinking, oh, thank God, like, it's working. Like, whatever right. it is, like, we're, we're, we're starting, we're, we're in a good starting place. For her next project, Williams returns to the professional place where she feels most at home, independent film. Good job, Eric. In Showing Up, Williams plays a sculptor on deadline for a show but distracted by the mundane challenges of daily life. It is her fourth movie with director Kelly Reichardt, dating back to their acclaimed 2008 film, Wendy and Lucy. Is it true that at this point she calls and says, I'm working on something, and you just cut her off and say yes? Yeah. You just do it, really, without seeing the script or anything like that? You're just in at yeah, this point? Yeah, that's what happened this time. That's she amazing. She called and said, you know, I've got something for us, and we got off the phone, and I said to my husband, well, I've got a job, and <laughs> sounds like we're going to Portland, and I think it'll be in the spring, and, you know, and then a few days later, the script arrives, but, um, you know, it just makes your life feel like long, when you can work with your friends mm. and stay in touch with them artistically and emotionally. It makes your life feel long and supple, and um, and I hope that we have like many, many points of return over the next 15 years. That's a rare relationship, though, is it not? Yeah, it I mean, really there aren't is. that it's many special, of those in your it? business, you know, right, where you, you just know. say, let's jump together and see what happens? I know, it really is, it really amazes me, because truly, like, just to make one of those movies with her was beyond my wildest dreams. Um, it, it occurred to me when she offered me this movie, I thought, like, this is going to be, like, the headline of my obituary, <laughs> like, that we, um, that I was, like, a, a contributor to the Kelly Reichardt body of work because mm. she's, she's become acknowledged as, you know, not just an important American filmmaker, but an important international filmmaker. Is this the kind of movie you like the most to make? I mean, you've done everything. You've done huge budget movies and you've done art movies and everything else, you just feel very comfortable in this arena with this director. Is that fair to say? 
Well, it feels it feels like very true to my heart and to why I even wanted to act in the first place. Oh, I really just wanted to make independent cinema. I wanted to make a home for myself and a life for myself and my family in independent cinema. That was my that was like what I had in my eye. You know, that was like my it was my dream. And so to to have branched out and sort of made bigger movies and to be comfortable in that arena also was a really big deal for me and took a lot of sort of work to like expand the space that I could mm. um, allow myself to fill. But these movies feel like where my heart is. Off screen, William's heart is in Brooklyn, where she lives with her husband, director Thomas Kale of Hamilton fame, and their children, a world away from rural Kalispell, Montana, where her own story began. I'm sure growing up in Montana, Hollywood seemed like it was a different planet. So when did you start dreaming about being an actor? Where did that come from in that childhood of yours? It was, when we lived in Montana, I was, I don't think I even, I think I probably thought that like people lived in the TV set. And <laughs> um, so I really didn't have like any concept of that that was a, a job or like something that people did. And, and then at a certain point we moved to San Diego and that's when, you know, San Diego's close to Los Angeles and there were just other kids that were acting. I don't really know how to describe it. It was just something that I kind of got swept up in without really being super intentional about it. Mm. It was just something that other people were doing and then suddenly I was one of the people that was doing it and no real rhyme or reason, like no, school nobody plays, in my- School plays, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, like school plays, yeah, yeah. And, but nobody in my family had any connections to Los Angeles or the film industry. And all of a sudden I was just like a kid in a carpool that was sort of going up and back and forth for these auditions. And you did pretty well. You got uh, some parts. Eventually, eventually, not at the beginning. I auditioned for two years in the beginning without ever getting a job. Oh, is that right? And I, that was auditioning regularly. I mean, mm -hmm. I was constantly going up and back for commercial auditions, TV show auditions, but I, I never got a single one. So I don't really know why they kept taking me there. <laughs> but she kept at it with small parts, including a role on Baywatch. Her big break came at 16, when she was cast on the hit teen drama, Dawson's Creek. Dawson, you just, you just try too hard. You're overzealous. It's my downfall. I love how even recently you've been talking about the foundation that that yeah, gave you, and the people you yeah. worked with, and your grams, and how you draw a line through everything back to Dawson's Creek. What do you mean when you say that? What was that education you got there? I think it was a few things. I think you know it was it was really a stabilizing force because I was I was quite young, um, but it taught me how to be responsible. It taught me how to get to work on time. It taught me how to prepare at night for the next day. It taught me sort of like the basics of how to take care of myself in a way that we were in like a very sleepy southern town and the crew really felt like they looked out for us. They knew how young we were and they kind of put like bumpers around us, you know, mm. just made sure that we were safe and taken care of.
soon after Dawson's Creek ended, Williams landed the role that would change her life in Brokeback Mountain, alongside Anne Hathaway, Jake Gyllenhaal, and the late Heath Ledger, who would become the father of her daughter. What was that time in your life like? It was huge for you, personally and professionally, but just to be a part of something that really had such an impact on the culture. Yeah, so hugely, um, and continues you know, I think that was such a big experience, I mean, in so many ways. But it was really, I mean, I sort of was on the side of it. I was watching, you know, what, how, how men reacted and how they would relate to Heath and Jake when they, the emotion that they held finally being able to see themselves um, on screen. And so to be part of something that felt like that wasn't just a movie. That mm. was, a, you know, a profound moment. I don't know what you would call it. Like, just I, it's not even political. It's just on a like an incredible on a on a human level. So to be a part of a movie that sort of transcends the the film and you know speaks to people in such a deep way. And then the four of you sort of find yourself at the Oscars and all these things are changing in your life. I, <laughs> I mean, to step into that world really for the first time, I think it's fair to say. What did that do to your life? I mean, it had a big impact on a lot of people's lives outside of yours, but what did it mean to yours? Oh, it was such a shock. I mean, like, you know, I was on Baywatch, so <laughs> those, those two things, I don't know, they go together. But it was, uh, it was wonderful, you know? We had a part of this, you know, important movie, and we had a beautiful, healthy little baby, and it was a, it was a, it was a great moment in time. And then from there, you go on in your career, doors sort of open and you get all these opportunities. So was that a fun time for you to sort of just look at the world and read scripts and be in demand a little bit after that? I don't that? know, I think it was really unnerving, you know, sort of after that, like, well, what do you do? What do you do next? I had never, I'd right. never felt like people, I never really had attention on me before in that kind of a way. And I think, mm. you know, well, now it feels like, a, well, people are watching. What if I make a mistake? Mm. That's really scary what would happen to me. So I think I felt a little bit f frozen for a moment. That feeling didn't last long. Williams went on to earn Oscar nominations for Blue Valentine, My Week with Marilyn, and Manchester by the Sea, and won an Emmy and a Golden Globe for her performance in the series Fosse Verdon. But it does feel like you you made smart decisions along the way. Is there a strategy to that for you? Or you just say, I like that director, I wanna work with her or with him? Yeah, is that yeah, it's, no, it it's very instinctive. It's like a reaction that happens between you and a piece of material, or it doesn't. Mm. Um, what about this is going to actually work on me and expand me as a person, as a mother? Which raises the question, what's next for you? Who what's knows? still out there? Is there more? Is there directing? Is there, feels like the world's open to you and you're always open to whatever's thrown at you, it seems like. Um, I am, I do, uh, I like to, I like to be surprised. Like I like to sort of not know what's next and then to sort of be struck by the feeling of, oh, this is it. You like to be a little scared or not know what's around the corner? Yeah, I do, I like yeah. to not know. Yeah, well, it seems to be working for you. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, so far so good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michelle. It's great to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much, thank you. It's such a pleasure.
the best player in the band? Me. Whether holding a guitar or a ping pong paddle, Marcus Mumford can play. We used to take a table on tour. I should be much better than that. Very backspinny. A lot of backspin going on. Oh. At the moment, the Mumford & Sons frontman is out on the road without his bandmates, touring behind his debut solo album, Self-Titled. It's a proper album in the way we don't see them anymore, which is you've got to listen to the whole thing from one to ten to hear the full story. Yeah, me and Beyonce trying to there keep, you go. The, keep the album fires burning. What made you want to sit down, step away from Mumford for a bit, and tell this story? I didn't think of it. I wasn't intentional about it at the beginning. I just wanted to write songs again. The first two songs that came out were Cannibal and Grace, which are the first two songs on the record. And as soon as I'd written them, I showed them to the guys in the band. I said, I don't know if this is a band record. I don't know if it's even a record yet, but it feels like something I maybe should do on my own. And they all completely agreed and supported it. So then the songs just started rolling one after the other. I spent about 18 months writing mm. and recording. Um, enlisted more support than I've ever had for anything I've done. So it's weird that it's called the solo record. It's the most collaborative piece of music I've ever worked on. And and yeah, the, the songs really led it. I was determined to follow the creative where it led. The album opens with Cannibal, Mumford's deeply personal and painful song about the sexual abuse he suffered as a child. But when I began to tell, it became the hardest thing I ever said out loud. The so weird with songs because you take the most private things that yeah. you have, and that moment of artist behavior where you write a song about something really personal and then you do the most public thing you could do with it and you go and publicize it play it to people and you it goes on the radio or whatever it it's just a really weird thing that we do as artists but i sort of refused to call it a record until i had all the songs because i just didn't want to think about releasing it until i knew there was something there to release and then i figured i'd think about that stuff later so really I didn't even call it an album until late last year. And then this year started thinking about how to present it to people. And at that point I started thinking, oh, I'm gonna to have to talk about this. I'm gonna to have to, and, and seeing that more as an opportunity than some sort of punishment is how I've approached it. And it feels good. I feel kind of free and happy and kind of fulfilled by, by doing the process. Was it a difficult decision or it sounds like it wasn't really a decision? It wasn't really a decision, no. Once I'd written it, I, you know, just became part of the collection of songs along with the other nine on the record. Um, and then early this year, I started thinking, okay, this is gonna be put out somehow. I know a lot of people have stepped out and said, oh my gosh, he's telling my story, I can tell mm. mine, things yeah, like that. Yeah, it's the reason I called it self-titled rather than using my name. Because I love the idea that other people might be able to access parts of my mm. story and project their own onto it or feel something from their own story in mine, which is really cool. Uh, it's sort of the magic of music, I think. After Cannibal comes Grace, a song that recounts the experience of Mumford telling his mother about the abuse only recently. I thought I'd, I'd talk my mum through that stuff, and I hadn't. So when I played her Cannibal was the first time she kind of clocked it. Wow. And so I wrote Grace, like, the first lyric is, well, how should we proceed without things getting too heavy? And that sort of acts, I think, as an invitation for the audience to join me on what I think becomes a story about freedom and recovery and has a lot of hope in it. I'm a, I'm a Beyonce guy. She always talks about leaving people with hope, you yes. know? And that's true, I think, on every song on the record. The first song ends with beginning again, and, um, and then it kind of goes on from there. The album closes with a song about forgiveness, co-written by Mumford's friend, yeah, Grammy winner, yeah. Brandi Carlisle. Release you from all of the blame I know how. The first lyric in the first song is, if I could forgive you. And the last one is, I will. And it's a statement of intent. It's not necessarily saying forgiveness is done and dusted. I think it's more of a process, like a left foot, right foot thing. Like, I'm going to choose to do this now. Did you feel like you needed to forgive yourself for something? Oh, yeah, for tons of stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah. From a really early age, had things hidden in my life, and they would cascade into other hidden things and it just you get tangled up in it all and so unpicking that and forgiving yourself for that stuff I think is an important part of kind of recovery. Have you found forgiveness not just for yourself but beyond? Uh, is that last song true? 
Well, I think I certainly find myself in a, I, I think with more access to compassion for people who behave in ways that seem like abhorrent or heinous to me. And behind like all these stories and certainly my own of like bad behaviors or behaviors that really affect other people in negative ways, there's normally a story underneath that. And so I think I'm able to not just see the way someone presents, but think, and I wouldn't project a story onto them, but think like, you've got a bunch of stuff going on in your life. And it seems by the way you're presenting to me that you haven't had the opportunity to look at that stuff. So I, instead of just writing someone off completely and saying like, you're not a person I want to ever associate with, which is that there's a lot of that in our culture at the moment. Yes. And I get it uh, completely. But the fact that it's more complicated than just one single narrative, nor normally there's layers of narratives there. I think I've got more access to compassion, maybe, than I did before. Self-titled is dedicated to Mumford's wife, the Oscar-nominated actress Carrie Mulligan. The pair have been married since 2012 and have two young children. You know, I think Yoko gave creative partners like sometimes a bit of a bad rep. There was one day actually we were at the studio and Carrie was showing up and she was driving and they had like these really fancy little placards to, to put in front of your parking spots. So like one saying Marcus Mumford on it and I parked there and she called me and she's like, where do I park? I said, there's a slot allocated for you. And when she showed up, I'd got them to print a Yoko sign and put it in her parking spot, which I was thrilled about. She's like, good gag, babe. She liked it. Uh, she liked yeah. it. Um, but I wouldn't have made it without her. There's good reason that it's dedicated to her. And she's been phenomenally supportive all the way. It's cool. Born in California to parents who were leaders in their church, Mumford moved with the family back to London at six months old. His prodigious talent for music was born in the kitchen. Do you remember, Marcus, when the spark was lit for you in terms of music? The kitchen in my household growing up was the place where we'd listen to the most music outside of the car. My mum's an amazing chef. She would be in the kitchen, make stuff, and I would sit on the floor, listen to music. And I remember pulling out pots and pans really? because I started on the drums. 
And then, yeah, listening to music with my mum in the kitchen. She had a vinyl player, so I put on House of the Rising Sun by the oh. Animals and um, Slow Train Coming. She had those records. Good on taste. Vinyl. And then Talis, a lot of vocal music. Wow. She was a kind of singer uh, in a choir. And you'd so, offer a little percussion. A little it. percussion, some harmonies, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then at what point did you say, I know you left college to pursue this, at what point did you say, this is something I really want to go after. I How still have, I, in my head, I still haven't said that. I'm still a semi-professional <laughs> in my head. I'm still going back to college at some point. Um, yeah, I left college on a sabbatical because yeah. I got offered a job playing drums with Laura Marling. And I went and did that. And during the course of that year, we set up the band. Yeah, and jumped up at the end of her shows and played a song or two. And then the first tour of the States we did, we were, half of us were her backing band. And... Wynn and Ben slept in the back lounge on the bus because there weren't enough bunks for us all. And, and then from there on, she really gave us the leg up to play our own shows. And we went from there. Mumford has spent more than a decade performing in arenas around the world with Mumford & Sons, the band he formed with friends in 2007. Their debut album, Sigh No More, was released in the U.S. in 2010, climbing to number two on the Billboard chart while selling more than three million copies and earning the band a Grammy nomination for Best New Artist. We did theaters once, and I think normally you do like two or three theater runs and then move up to the bigger rooms. And it just went, we climbed that ladder fast, I think. We were talking earlier today um, about a performance that grabbed a lot of people, which was at the Grammys in 2011. I was watching again this morning, the way you all are stomping on that riser and then the horns come in and you yep. have this look about two minutes in of just complete joy. <laughs> Almost like, can you believe where we are, boys? Mm. Do you remember that night well? Because yeah, obviously things changed for you after that. Yeah, Bob Dylan said to me during, because that was the one we did with Dylan and the Avid brothers. And Dylan, pretty much the only thing he said to me during rehearsals was keep that boot going, because I was stomping. Yeah. And, and I've, I've considered that a mantra. <laughs> it's led to a lot of four on the floor songs. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think and it was funny, because after we played our song, the Avits played their song, we went behind the curtain to get ready to all come on to play Maggie's Farm with Dylan. And I think it was probably when the live broadcast was happening, to however many tens of millions of people. I think it was the first time he'd heard our music, but he kind of liked it. And we came back while the Avis were playing and he walked over to me and he went, play that again. And I still had my guitar in my hands. And I like really quietly, because we're behind the curtain, the Avis are right there. I start playing him the cave and he goes, I can sing on that. Let's do Maggie's Farm to that. And we've been practicing for three days. We were all like, what are you talking, what do you mean? But you're Bob Dylan, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. He's like, I'm gonna sing it on that. And then his bass player, Tony, came over and was like, Bob, we're not doing that. You know, we practiced this. <laughs> we're literally walking on stage in 30 seconds. Is that an so, out-of-body experience that Bob Dylan is leaning in and giving yeah, you notes, like, let's like jam yeah, this way? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, totally. But one I'll never forget, you know. Cause I know my weakness, know my voice. Mumford & Sons' next two albums debuted at number one making the band a foot-stomping international sensation that fans will be happy to hear is just on a break. The band isn't broken up. I also see it as like, hopefully, one in very many records I make throughout my career. A new way of making music on his own, giving Mumford a new perspective too. I think I've taken myself slightly less seriously, which helps. And I know it's just a period of time in my life and I'll go back to the band next. And I'm really excited about that. But for now, I'm just trying to enjoy this, this period. Oh, yeah. You teed that I'm one done. for you. I'm done.
for now. All right? He's just about to get started. It is hard work being John Luther, the good cop with a dark side, played for more than a decade now by Idris Elba. Because I'm ready. It looks like a lot of fun as a viewer to play this character. Nope. No? no. Just brutal? Because you're getting beat up so much? Getting up at 4 a.m. <laughs> in the rain, cold. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just like, can we do a Luther where he's uh, in Hawaii? <laughs> and there's like, you know, uh, maybe it's a tropical storm, so there is some rain, <laughs> but not so cold. I smell a sequel. 100%. Hawaii. 100%. Yeah. Luther, Luther Jamaica. <laughs> I mean, I say it isn't fun. I've played him for 10 years and he's yeah. one of my, you know, sort of dearest characters, if you like. Elba has played several. In this country, he is known best, perhaps, as drug dealer Stringer Bell from the iconic HBO drama, The Wire. No matter what we call heroin, it's gonna get sold. But in Elba's native UK, Luther looms large. The popular five season BBC series now spun into the new movie, Luther, The Fallen Son. For me, playing a detective on the other side of the fence, you know, Stringer on as a drug dealer, and Detective Luther, for me, that was like, yeah, I get to reinvent something, and myself, actually. And um, there's something about Luther being this forthright character that will stop at nothing. Mr. DCI John Luther, well, I mean, it's not, I, um, I was a DCI in your department. John Luther is an ordinary detective with sort of extraordinary circumstances, but very relatable, you know? We're not talking about end of the world crime. We're talking about guys that have real bad sort of ethics, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he, he can't stand that. But what the film has now given us is taking this central character, Luther, and putting him in these landscapes, in these scenarios uh, that could be as epic as the ones that James Bond sort of covers, you know what I mean? And I hope people kind of go, oh, wow, James versus John, you know what I mean? Like, I really hope that. Don't think I didn't notice. There's a moment at a bar, you're sitting there. I'd say a long day calls for a martini. <sighs> Whiskey. I remember seeing that in the script and was like, <laughs> Are we sure, bro? I mean, this is like, it's right on the nose. Was that a nod to the outside calls for you to play James Bond? Not purposely, but you know, <laughs> I think uh, those who know, know. It's a great moment. So now you've, you've certainly raised the question then com with the Bond comparison, the franchise anyway, of sequels. Mm. It feels to me, having just watched the movie, like there's more to come. Yeah. Fair to say, or at least that's the way you'd like it to go? Uh, I think it's fair to say that. Yeah, I think that the ending, again, really sort of opens that door for what are the possibilities? Where does John go next? And I think that's quite on purpose. Yeah. Um, I think we all, you know, have a sort of wish to take a, a few chapters and, and see this landscape grow and grow. I, I do. I mean, I feel like there's so much we can offer. Because Lutherland is really wherever Luther goes. Mm. So if, if we saw Luther in Colombia and it had that same sort of Luther aesthetic and it's dark, you know, I think that would still be as engaging as seeing him in sort of London as we know it. Elba was born and raised in London's working class Canning Town, the son of African immigrants. How and when was the seed to become an actor planted? How did you get to that place from a place that was so far from Hollywood or show business? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I knew in high school, secondary school for, for me, that I wanted to be an actor. I knew that at the age of 16, that this was sort of my career path. I just didn't know how to get there. And as soon as I left school, I sort of, you know, got into college. And I sort of did a performing arts course, which sort of covered all the bases, but it was right there when I sort of got introduced to method acting and Robert De Niro. I just became fixated. So I was 19 after two years of college. You know, I worked with my dad. My dad worked at Ford's Motor Company. I worked with him for a little bit. And then I saved enough money and I was like, I'm going to New York. And everyone's going, all my friends were like, you're going where? What? New York? What's in New York? Who do you know? I was like, my career's in New York. I want to go to New York. It's like, it's like <laughs> you're not even acting. You're not even an actor yet. You want to go to New York? Good luck. 
And it wasn't it wasn't easy for many, many years finding jobs. You were DJing and bouncing and paying your rent and doing all the things you had to do to survive. So what were those early years in America like for a young struggling actor? You know, I think I'd saved up somewhere like thirty six thousand pounds and used it all within six months. Mm -hmm. And I was broke and I was not booking jobs. Casting directors were interested, but not really. You know what I mean? Like, don't come to a place where they already have hamburgers. You have to come with something <laughs> different. Okay? So there's really good actors here. But I just came with this dream, and then I was really, I'm, I'm a tenacious guy, you know. I stick at it. And so is it true that when the script for The Wire came your way, you were in the Astro van? Is there any yeah. truth to that? <laughs> yeah. You were spending a few nights in the van? Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a very tough time. I was married at the time, and... And uh, my wife and I were going through a very bad time. You know, she was pregnant. It was just a rough time. Mm. I could barely scrape enough money for our, you know, unborn child. And I lived in the van for a little bit. Uh, but at the time, I was auditioning during the day. And, you know, my daughter was due to be born sort of like early January. And we're talking about November now. And this script comes in. It's like, you know, this is a pilot. You know, again, I was seeing really good casting directors by this junction, okay? This pilot's come in, it's called The Wire. Go in and see the guys, but do yourself a favor, don't speak in your own accent, you know? Just keep it uh, American. And I I did, and quite frankly, it was the moment that my daughter was born, I literally got the phone call that, hey, you know, we want to offer you the role. The same day? Yeah. Exactly. Wild. The same day, yeah. I don't know if you believe in fate, but there was something going on that I, day. I mean, of course I do. That's of incredible. It's it incredible. A, it was a really special time. Changed my life. Changed my my daughter's life. You know. What did that mean to you professionally? Then, when that show became such an iconic series and such a success, and everyone knew your name and your face, and you weren't this close anymore, you were there. Yeah. What did that mean as you went forward in your career? You know, it just restored my faith, man. Like that's yeah. bottom line. You know what I mean? It's really easy to sort of sort of have no faith, but when when stuff's really tough, and you just you know, should I give up or shouldn't I? Mm. Don't give up. As, as bleak as it's my, and honestly, that story, you couldn't get any more bleak than that. You know what I mean? Like, I have a child coming, I'm broke, I'm living in, a, in America, in New York City. And then, you know, there it came. So it meant a lot to me. It was a life changer. Um, it changed my life financially, obviously, but it really did catapult my career into essentially, you know, what I'm, I'm still dining of that, that life changing moment. Right. I mean, why work harder than you should? <laughs> no, I... Whether you're talking about The Office or Mandela... I just share in the whole of South Africa. Luther, of course, and all these amazing series and mm. going to the Marvel Cinematic Universe <laughs> um, and getting all these opportunities. Talk about night and day where you couldn't... You couldn't find couldn't a job. Book. And now yeah. all of a sudden it's like, we want you to be in all these Marvel movies. Yeah. It's got to be sort of a head trip to say, I can sort of have my choice now of things that I want to do. Definitely, yeah. Someone asked me the other day, like, do you still audition? And I was like, no. Like, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was like an arrogant moment. I was just like, no, I don't audition ever, you know? Um, it, it's a very, very different scenario now. Have yeah. you ever had a chance to tell De Niro how he inspired you? You know what? No. Oh, we got to make that happen. I know. I, I mean, I, I've said it in so many interviews, and I was like, well, I'm going to meet De Niro. And she's like, dude, you, you actually inspired me. You know, he had a, an office down in... Um, Tribeca. Tribeca. Yeah. I, I literally fanboyed out one day and just went to his <laughs> office. And uh, I think he... I had read in the stage that he was um, the, the, the stage newspaper, mm-hmm. that he was holding auditions for a, a Bronx Tale. It was his film he was directing. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I, I got to be in this. You know what I mean? I got to find a way to be right. in it. And uh, so I show up and I said, oh, I've got an audition at the front desk. And they're like, because yeah, go up to the next floor. So now I know I'm blagging this, right? I'm like, wow, I'm going up to the next floor. This must be where Bob De Niro is. And this woman comes out and she's like, hi, who are you? I said, oh, uh, my name's Idris. Uh, here's my resume. She's like, how did you get in this building? I said, oh, 
I'm auditioning for a Bronx Tale. She's like, honey, we already did the auditions. I'm just curious to know how you got in here. Ooh. I was like, um, well, I just did some research and I, I hustled it. She was like, wow, you got some nuts on your boy. I tell you, I have to. Um, OK, I'll take your resume, uh, but we don't have any more auditions. Wow. See you later. Wow. True story. Wow. And I was like, OK. You know, it would be fun if we went down there right now and did that again. <laughs> I'm here to see Bob. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Elba also is an accomplished DJ who has booked Coachella twice and one royal wedding. His other passion started as a side hustle long before acting paid the bills. You play a song and there's 5,000 people hands in the air. That energy, you can't get that in films. You can get that maybe in theater, but it's not as reactive. When it's working, it's incredible. Mind you, when it's not working, like, <laughs> Do you even have nights like that? Even yeah. though they go, oh, Idris Elba's here, that's great. I, I think I always have nights like that. My team would be like, you're too hard on yourself. I'm like, no, I just didn't hit it. I didn't hit it how I need to. Yeah. That's how you keep it sharp, though. 100%. That's how you keep it sharp. 100%. Um, I just feel like listening to your journey at moments like this, when you're out celebrating this big Netflix movie you had, you must have a moment of pause and go, man, I worked for this. <laughs> you know, I came a long way, not just from New York City, but going back to your hometown mm. and working in that Ford plant. Mm. Do you pause and think, man, I've hustled my way pretty far here? Yes, I do. There's no doubt about that. But you know what? I still feel like I've got so much to offer. You know what I mean? I still feel like that guy that's sort of waking up in the van going, today's the day. I really do, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I'm greedy or anything, it's just that I never really want to lose that sort of inquisitive, what can I do, what can I offer, how can I sharpen, how can I achieve? I never want to lose that. And next up, Luther goes to Hawaii. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Hawaii, Jamaica, Yeah, just Columbia, somewhere warm with warm, palm bro. trees, right? Yes, 100%. <laughs> Thank 100%. you, man, this Thank was you fun. Very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.
like how I decorated the room for us? I'm so touched you did it. I was here at 4 a.m. It shows. Up in the rafters. It really, I, this doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> Just wanted to make you comfortable. You have. Hi. I'm Scott. Over the last decade or so, Paul Rudd has made himself comfortable as a Marvel superhero. Bringing him in. Sorry about this. An unexpected career turn, perhaps, until he heard about his character. <laughs> what has it been like for you, Paul, to step into this Marvel world, which is amazing and so cool and great, but also intense from the fan side and they have expectations about the characters? You've right. done a lot in your career, but starting in 2015, you went to like this totally different place. Have you enjoyed sort of being a part of that family? I have. I really have. It's an honor and a, a cool thing to be a part of something that so many people care about, that they go see, that certainly has a history, and uh, and that's and, and you're also a part of a team. Like I really like all of the other actors. Were you surprised by the phone call you got 10 years ago to enter the Marvel Universe? I think people had like a preconceived notion of that you're funny and you can do all these different kinds of things, but superhero, I think you've said even for you, was like, oh, me? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't expecting that, yeah. uh, that call. You know, it was, uh, it was originally going to be directed by Edgar Wright, who's a friend of mine, and Edgar's films and um, it seemed like, oh yeah, well, I love his movies and, and we were friends and I, and I thought this, is, this would be cool and I thought oh this seems this seems fun and also Ant-Man that seems like one maybe people would buy me in more than Superman Thor yeah they're definitely not buying me as Thor yeah I noticed the latest Ant-Man movie Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania kicks off phase five of the Marvel Cinematic Universe a notoriously secretive franchise I want to stipulate for our audience, I have not seen the movie, not because I don't want to see the movie, because I can't see the movie, mm -hmm. and you can't say much about the movie. Yeah. So what would you like to talk about? The Fablemans. It'd be our secret movie, just yours and mine. <laughs> we can talk about that. Give Spielberg all the awards. It's just a great movie. It's, you know, it's like the love of movie making. Yeah. We could talk about other movies. Have you seen anything recently you liked? The Banshees of Inna Sharon, did you catch that? Caught it, loved it. Colin Farrell, Brendan yeah. Gleeson. Barry Keoghan. I saw that, I thought, give that guy the Oscar, because God, what a performance. Top Gun Maverick. A lot of fun. I don't know if I'd vote for it. No? They're all such great fighter pilots. Haven't any fun yet? We nailed this interview. You're an interesting man, Scott Lane. I don't know who you are, but you've made a big mistake. Okay, I'm an Avenger. Let's talk about where we find Ant-Man in this third film, to the extent you can tell me that. It is after the events of Endgame. There was a five year gap, people turned to dust and now they're back and it's a, uh, if you haven't seen Endgame, I just ruined a whole bunch of stuff for people <laughs> watching this show. <laughs> oh yeah, spoiler alert. Um, it's picking up with now the character that I play, Scott Lang, thinks that, okay, finally, and move forward now with my life and you know that doesn't happen exactly the way that he'd hoped or planned you have talked about getting ready for these movies you talked to chris pratt yeah. about how to become kind of superhero fit right and to paraphrase i think it was <laughs> eliminate all pleasure from your life in terms of eating and drinking and things yeah. like that did you have to do that again for number three i did i never try and fall too far off of it because getting back to that is really right. hard but i think i kind of fell off of it without me noticing when you're in it, um, it's not bad. It's kind of challenging yeah. and fun and you feel good. And, but it's also you think, all right, this is finite. I know I've got, I'm going to be doing this for the next three or four months and then, right. then I won't have to do it. But um, it's, it's a lot, but it's not, so, it, it's not so bad when you're in it. And you're doing it for a good reason, right? And then you pick it up. You're doing it for work, but then it becomes a part of your life and you, and you maintain it. So right. what I'm saying is, Presumably. You look is. great. Oh, well, th <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, um, uh, I, I would like to get back into the swing of things a little more than I've been, but. Yeah. We're in a break right now? In the, yeah. Continue. Well, I mean, as much as, uh, yeah, ish. Yeah. Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But it's not really a break. It's just because it then becomes a, oh, God, what's more boring than an actor talking about his workout regimen? 
<laughs> See how it baited you into it, you too? You suckered me in. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, how many uh, calories a day, oh, Paul? God. <laughs> You know it's bad when you're weighing your chicken breast. <laughs> I hate myself when I'm doing it. <laughs> My Jesus. Oh God, what have I become? Momentum, right? Jump, tap. I know how to do it, Dad. Oh, do you? Last time we talked a few years ago, you said your kids were maybe more aware of your career now because of Ant-Man. They used to walk by a movie theater and see a poster Yeah. and say, well, you know, it's when my kids were very young. Yeah. And they don't really understand. You know, I'm not going to, you know, sit my kids down when they're three <laughs> and say, you know, hold on. Well, I've got some DVDs to show you. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't really even explain what of I course. did. Yeah. Um, my son, when he was about four or five, went to a movie theater to see a movie with his friends. And there was a m movie poster that I was on. It was in the lobby. So they all just thought that I worked at the movie theater, which I thought was very cute. It's really cute. Um, and, and, then, and then, yes, uh, a few years later, I think when he was 15, he finally put it all together. <laughs> a father of two, the 53-year-old Rudd has been a favorite face on movie posters since his breakout role in the 1995 classic, Clueless. But it seems to me from the outside, you've kept who you are. What advice would you give to an actor who's trying to make it in your business? I don't know. I mean, I think there's, as far as anyone's trying to make it in any business, there's no one way. Um, I certainly learned that, that it, it, there's all different ways and you can eventually achieve your goals and the way you achieve your goal, if you, uh, it's not going to happen the way you might think it would. Right. Um, but I would say that the, the one thing that is um, important is to, to be uh, polite, be on time and be nice to people. Um, I just think that that is the way it should always be, no matter what you do. Um, I've been certainly lucky enough to work with some of the most successful people in this industry who have had amazing careers. I mean, I'm doing it right now um, on Only Murders in the Building. I'm good. Rudd is a guest star on the upcoming third season of the Hulu Murder Mystery, playing alongside Steve Martin, wow. Martin Short, Selena Gomez, and now... I do think it could get a little bit better. Academy Award-winning icon, Meryl Streep. Martin Short and Steve Martin, yeah. That's Mount Rushmore. Uh, I mean, truly uh, hero worship. So to get to work with them was, uh, I, I mean, I still kind of can't believe it. Selena, I adore. I've worked with her a couple times, and she's the greatest. And then when I heard Meryl Streep was on board, it just didn't seem real. It still doesn't seem real. <laughs> What is that set like? Is it the way we hope it is, which is funny and ad libby and all those yeah. things? Yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, well, I have only worked on it a couple of days, and um, you know, to just to be a r around them, the c dynamic. I mean, you've spent time with Steve Martin and Martin Short together. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's just uh, constant insults, and um, to hear them just kind of to, to you know. To just hear them kind of knock each other, but there's so much love between those two guys. Like, you, you, they adore each other, they're crazy about each other, and it's just so fun to have a front row seat to all of that. It is, it's fun to sit back and watch the thing that you've watched from a distance up close like that, I mm -hmm. imagine. I, do you still have, and this must be one of them, sort of like a pinch me thing where you grew up watching these guys, you looked up to them, you worshiped them, as you said, and now they're taking their cues from you in a scene? It's uh, surreal doesn't even cover it. Um, and it's, for one thing, like, to, to feel that way when you're acting with somebody. I mean, when the script is kind of there and you're, you're, you know, you're acting, you're in a scene with somebody, it's a little easier to just kind of forget about it because you're in the scene and you're the character and you have a bit more freedom and you're a bit more relaxed, weirdly, to kind of interact with these people. Um, it's when you know you're just kind of like hanging out in the green room right. or whatever, like waiting as during a lighting setup, and just you know talking and, and to just uh, find myself sometimes in just regular conversation or uh, you know a witness to like what we were talking about a, a comedy show happening you know spontaneously right in front of me between just these brilliant guys you know making jokes and stuff. It's 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 on it's a non-stop pinch me moment. I'm pinching myself 
<laughs> all day. <laughs> Good luck tonight. Hmm. Thanks. Good luck is a curse in the theater. I know that. They say don't meet your heroes. I've met many of my heroes. I'd say almost all of them have exceeded my expectation. Hmm. And I think if you want to have any kind of longevity, people don't want to be um, put down or anything like that. People want to work with people who are pleasant to be around. And if you are rude to people or um, belittle them or are a pain in the ass, once you stumble, you mm. might not get another shot because people just think, oh, that person's a headache. Um, I would, so any actor I would say that was starting off, I would say, like, you know, you're not bigger than anybody else and you're not bigger than the project. Nobody cares about you. Um, don't buy the hype um, mm. and just uh, show up and, and do your job. I'm so happy to hear you say that because it's my experience too. The people who have succeeded, the people with longevity, are not jerks. Jerks. They're there for the team. They lift up people below them. They help them along. Yeah. And, it, and it's also, I think, they have the the insecurity that they may have had has sort of fallen away. Confident right. with who they are. Right. And they don't feel like they have to do that. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, we've seen it across industries where somebody slips up and nobody's there to catch them because of the way they've treated people, right? Yeah. It's I, a good way to that. be. It's just a good way to be also in, in life. Life is so hard. He wants to be around assholes. Yes. <laughs> I'm almost done with this, by the way. If somebody would hop to it and fill this up, maybe I could finish this interview. Turn on the romantic music now to match up top. A couple more drinks. Congratulations on Ant-Man. Can't wait to see murders. Only murders. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks for joining me on this. Thank you for putting in Date. all of this work, by the way. It was worth it. It, it. I know you're a busy guy. Yeah. I mean, you're spinning a lot of plates that you would come in to this bar. Yeah, I skipped work this morning to come in and do it. It shows. My pay was docked. <laughs> well, it certainly put me in a mood. <laughs> and uh, I can't thank you enough.
I've never done this behind a bar. I know you look, you're slinging it pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. I like a little bit of a kick, put some tahini on the rim. I know it's early, but whatever. Here you go, Willie. Aaron, thank you so much. I'm honored. Cheers. Cheers. A toast to the end of a tour where Marin Morris sold out venues across the country and mixed up her famous margaritas on the bus. Yeah, I'm just not ready for it to be over. I wish we had done more shows. <laughs> Maybe we can add a few at the end. Yeah, we'll just here and now. for fun. I'll, go, I'll go busk in the street. <laughs> yeah. I bet you would, actually. You've, uh, done, yeah. you've done it before. I'll open the guitar case. The tour shares a name with her latest album called Humble Quest. What does Humble Quest mean to you? I think from 2020 on uh, to now, I've learned a lot about myself because my tour got canceled. I lost my producer, Busby, in late 2019. And so just everything was really humbling. I think just about being a human. It's like you are not in control. You never were. It was strange for all of us, but I have to imagine for someone who's been on the road for, what, 15 years or something like that, doing shows, grinding, hustling the whole time to just hit the brakes for two years. It was probably disorienting to you in some way. Your husband too, because he's a performer as well. I think the bottom fell out in many ways for me. And I've sort of learned through therapy that I have been doing this hustle since I was 10 or 11 years old. I'm 32. I haven't stopped. It took the world coming to a halt for me to stop. Marin's son Hayes was born in March of 2020 in those first days of the pandemic. I think a lot of identity crises <laughs> happened there, not just like being a new parent and a new mother and dealing with, you know, postpartum depression for the first time and reeling from that and trying to like find the forest through the trees, but also just knowing my worth without someone clapping for me. I kind of felt like this sounds so cheesy, but I, I felt like a woman, like the, the, the sort of form I was supposed to take a long time ago that I've been in arrested development over, it finally came because I had to stop doing this thing that always gave me this um, pride. So how did that manifest itself? What did it mean to you to become a woman, as you say? I think that I'm a child still in a lot of ways that I haven't properly matured uh, because I've always been able to throw it into music. But as far as relationships go, I think from a very early age, I've been taking care of myself and other people and just performing. And um, yeah, I think when you have your own kid and you, you kind of can't go to work, your purpose is very different. And so you kind of have to just like ch chisel it out of stone yourself. And I think I was probably supposed to do that a long time ago, but it just didn't happen until now. Don't know why, don't know why I let you, but I do. Cause I love chasing after you. She spent the time at home reflecting and writing songs with her husband, Ryan Hurd, a fellow singer-songwriter. As far as being creative with him goes, it was like, can we just please write something light to pull me out of this, like, pandemic doldrum and I don't want to you know sit in the ashes very long here so he kind of just helped me in song form and in just conversation form figure out how to get to the, the light I drove circles around this town trying to ride circles around this town trying to say something with me and something we're singing about she began to find that light by reaching back to her early days in Nashville, long before she was a Grammy-winning chart-topping star. Circles Around This Town stands out among other great songs. What is the message of that song? What are you saying? Well, the, the line that I love is, I thought when I had hit it, it all looked different, but I've still got the pedal down, driving circles around this town. And that to me was like, I moved to Nashville 10 years ago with nothing. And I really had to build myself up and build my song repertoire just from scratch. And I think I still have that grind in me that is like, your best song is the last one you wrote. So you always are trying to one up yourself. And that's the beautiful competition 
art form that is Nashville songwriting is like all your friends are better than you. Mm. And it just, it doesn't make you downtrodden. It makes you excited to show them the last thing you wrote. So that community there is really special to me because I feel like they hold me accountable. They also make me a better writer every single time I go back into the room. Yeah, isn't it interesting? I found this too, where you think in the course of your career, there's going to be some moment where you go, I did it. And you put your feet up. But if you have the motor that people like you and I probably both have, yeah. you never put your feet up, right? Yeah, I mean, Ryan, my husband jokes that uh, he'll be wheeling me off the casino <laughs> stage <laughs> when we're like, I'm 90 or something. That's going to be my fate. It's like, I'll probably just die on stage. <laughs> Um, because I love it so much. I don't want to take time off. I don't like the idea of saving up a bunch and retiring because it's not a job to me. It's, it's like my passion. up on the honky-tonk circuit in her home state of Texas, Morris spent her early years in Nashville writing songs for other people, but it was the one she kept for herself that changed her life. My Church was a coming out party for Morris, and the hits have been coming ever since. I'm a 90s baby in my 80s Mercedes. Including two number one singles. When the bones are good, the rest don't Off of her second album, Girl. Don't you hang your head low. And of course, the relentlessly popular song, The Middle, where she sang lead vocals with Gray and Zed. Did you have any sense when you put that song out that it was going to become this? massive hit number one and change your life in the way that it did? I think it just opened up a huge world audience to my voice. And so if anyone ever heard that like, baby, they'd be like, who is this? Oh, Maren Morris, who's that? And then, you know, they would go to my previous work. So why don't you just meet me in the middle, middle, in the middle, middle? When you sit down to write any new album now, do you think about hits at this point? Or are you just trying to write great songs? I think a hit for me at this point is just a byproduct of hopefully a great song. I can't go in and create with that formula in my head of what I think a hit will be because then you end up following a trend that someone has already set. Um, and I think that you want it to be the opposite of that. You want to set it and create something that's new, or if it is reminiscent or nostalgic of something else, it's done in a way that's really fresh. And um, so, yeah, it's at this point, I, I've had crossover success. I've had songs on pop radio, on hot AC, on country. I'll always take it when it comes, but I don't go in and set out to 
be the hit maker. I just want to write a great song and I want to connect with my friends that I'm writing it with and connect to a higher self or God or whatever it is in that room. That's what I'm there to do. I hesitated to use the term crossover, but since you used it, yeah. what does that mean to you exactly? Because it seems to me that genre doesn't really matter as much anymore. Yeah. If you're good, you're good, and people find it wherever it is. Everything has gone over to streaming, and um, people are just pulling up playlists based on mood, yeah. uh, which I love. That's kind of how I search for things. But respecting and staying true to a root of what made you fall in love with a genre in the first place is important, but um, I, it's not my Bible. Uh, I think that I am so influenced by so many genres and I've never said otherwise. Like from my church on, it's always been the kitchen sink. Success in music has given Morris a voice outside of it too. She has been outspoken on social issues from abortion rights and gun control to the need for diversity in country music and defending trans youth. You use your voice and your platform to speak out on issues. When you started to do that, was there any trepidation of, I'm about to step in it, and now I'm gonna be in the middle of it? Yeah, I think it's gotten more galvanized since I've had my son that I am really trying to make something beyond music, and I want people to look around at my shows and realize okay, this is really loving and safe and comfortable. Like no matter what walk of life or where you come from, I want you to be able to be safe at my show. And I'm willing to be uncomfortable to do that. Is there a risk to it? Because I would say I'm a fan of country music. Most artists aren't gonna sit down in an interview and talk about the things you talk about or to even go on social media and take on those issues because they say, maybe I believe that, maybe I do feel that way. It's just not worth the fight. It's not worth losing fans. Do you feel any hit from doing that? I mean, Honestly, like when I put my church out, I, I kind of got my first dose of criticism of people saying the song is like blasphemous at my church. And I remember, you know, oh wow, I'm really gonna have to have some thick skin to get through this if this is like the song that's already pissing people off in a very weird way. So I think from the get-go, I've gone through the chapters of um, feeling just the, the criticism and knowing that, you know what, you're gonna piss people off either way, so you better let them know where you stand. And I think that, yeah, I've probably lost listeners along the way, um, but I think the ones I've gained and the ones I've retained, they know exactly who I am and what they're getting, and I see the residual effect of it now that time has passed of the positivity that it's ingrained into the, the fan base. Um, so even if you take a hit here and then, you know, here and there, it's, it's, uh, it's worth it. With the Humble Quest tour now wrapped, it seems Morris has a new itch. I want to do Broadway. You do? Yeah. I've really tried to just scare myself the last few years. I like hosted a late night show, had never done that. Yeah. I flew with the Air Force Thunderbirds in like a fighter jet. <laughs> I'm talking to you, I'm just kidding. Um, That's an adventure. Yeah. Living her life with some spice and a kick. That is delicious, truly. Not just because you made it. Thank you for giving Cheers. me a bar to do it in. <laughs> Cheers again. Cheers. Thank you.
Hemsworth plays a big, strong superhero in the movies. But now he is putting his real life strength to the test with no special effects. And I look down and <laughs> I feel like I have vertigo and huge rush of adrenaline, brief moments of, uh oh, I can't do this. In the National Geographic docuseries Limitless, streaming on Disney Plus, Hemsworth confronts his fears by pushing himself to extremes. Did they explain to you, Chris, that you'd be walking across a beam a thousand <laughs> feet above yeah. Sydney or crawling through fire or fighting for your life in a swimming pool? There was little snippets of that, but I think intentionally they held back on the real details, I think. <laughs> there might have been, I might have been running for the hills if they'd told me too much. One of the best ways to protect myself from the ravages of stress is to confront it head on. Behind the muscles and the hammer, Hemsworth battles stress and anxiety, just like us mortals. The first episode, it's about stress. Was that piece of it hard for you to say, I'm gonna drop the veil a little bit and yeah. just show fans who I am off screen? It was probably my biggest hesitation. I'm used to being behind the mask of a character. To then play yourself and confront some things that are stressful, are, are concerning, are problematic. It was kind of like being in a, a therapy session at times, but without the rebuttal of the, the advice at the end of it. <laughs> <Right>. So, <laughs> What are the things you think your fans will be surprised to learn that stress you out <laughs> in real life? Because it's pretty mundane stuff that we all go through. You know, if I can prep myself for an event and I'm walking on stage and the red carpet, and I'm like, okay, I'm in the zone, I'm ready for it. For me, when I go out in the public and it catches me out of nowhere or I'm sort of mm. weaving through the crowd and it's fine, no one's really paying attention, I'm with my kids at a restaurant and they start flipping out. There's a scene and then people are watching and then, you know, phones are coming out and you kind of triggers the my fight or flight in a pretty intense right. way. And so one of the episodes was about stress and about managing that. and. Uh, it was a big reminder for me you know, that, that this is incredibly detrimental to our health, living in that state constantly, having the cortisol and adrenaline you know, flooding through the body, especially when we're not exerting it physically and you know, having to run or fight or do something. But I think part of the lesson of the show is you can do something about it. Yeah. You learn and then you apply it, and I don't want to give away too much, but you're in a very precarious position, very high in the mm -hmm. air, and you actually stop and turn down your heart rate. Yeah. Are you able to use all those techniques you learned on the show? I do. I, I take more moments of pause, I think, than I did before. And not just out of feeling like I need to catch my breath, but understanding the science behind it and having seen it play out in real time in the episode when I'm walking across the, uh, the skyscraper off the beam and my heart rate goes up to 145 and then through some breathing techniques and focus, bring, go, bring it back down to about 85. Yeah, that was pretty remarkable. And... I can trust the science and hear about it and hear, hear someone tell me, but going through it myself and seeing it work was, was, it was a great sort of validation that, okay, some of this is within our control. You know, we're not, and we shouldn't be a victim to it and let it be sort of fear-based constantly. I don't want stress to rule my life or take a toll on my health. One of the other episodes that's incredibly poignant is the one about memory. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to tackle the issue of memory for you? That was one of the key pillars of health and wellness and we talk about longevity and memory is uh, absolutely essential. They did a deep dive into my blood work and, and my genetics and found some things and some indications that, um, that put me in a very high category, a risk category for Alzheimer's. You have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. How much higher? Probably somewhere between eight and ten times higher. It's an extraordinary moment when the doctor tells you that and it yeah. just stops you in your tracks. It was a real shock. And to all of a sudden be told, oh, this may be the thing that might take you out was like, whoa. But became a wonderful motivator to make changes and pay attention to my sleep habits and my stress management. Look again, if it also can help people go, oh, maybe I could mm. do some investigating here and figure out some ways to give myself the best fighting chance, then great. Yeah, it's, uh, again, there are things we can do, and it's good for people to know yeah. that, even if they're not in the risk zone yet. Yeah, I think, like, I, f I found it um, comforting also, like, genetics plays a part in everything and the outcome, but the majority 
of the outcome is based on our lifestyle choices and, and what we choose to participate in, what our sleep habits are, how we manage stress. The benefits are for me, not just sort of physically, but emotionally. You know, if I'm paying attention to those things, I'm a far better, happier person. You're still a young man, but was part of the reason you took on this series because you are thinking about legacies, maybe not the right word, but like what you want out of this life? It was a real sort of wake up to, um, if I continue in a sprint, you know, the finish line being death, one day I'll be there and I'll go, oh yeah, what, what, what just happened, you know? I had no idea it was gonna teach me that we get one shot at it as far as we know mm. and make the most of it. Hemsworth grew up humbly with his parents and two brothers moving between their home in Melbourne and cattle ranches in the Australian outback. So for a young boy in the Northern Territory, what was life like? Didn't own a pair of shoes for the first sort of year we were there just because it was too hot. Your feet become leather, you're running around on the rocks and stones. You're trying to keep up with all the, the local indigenous kids who are tough as hell and, and they're laughing if I'm, you know, <laughs> stepping on prickles and having to cry. My most vivid memories are of Northern Territory in the outback and most beautiful memories too. So how did a boy who grew up, I don't know, four or five hours from the nearest town in the outback of the Northern Territory even get the idea that he could be an actor, let alone that that would be a job and a career. Yeah, there was no acting school really near me. No one, there wasn't a whole lot of sort of theater projects or anything. I was just a fan of movies and I love books and storytelling and the, the fantasy and the adventure to it. When I was finishing high school, my brother did a, a film and television course once a week and said, oh, you should do this. And I did one course and was like, that's it, I'm going to Hollywood. I told my careers advisor at school and she was like, oh, okay, what's your backup? I was like, don't, don't have one, don't have one. It requires a, a certain obsessiveness and a compulsive commitment to it, you know, which is fantastic in the earlier days coming up and you're like deflecting the nose and the rejections and so on. You're plowing forward and then nothing's going to stop you. The road to Hollywood began on Australian TV including a star-making stop on the popular soap opera, Home and Away. This isn't gonna work, you know. What is it? You trying to come between Rachel and me. After three years of playing a heartthrob, Hemsworth was ready for that flight to Los Angeles. The first sort of three, four months I was there, it was like, no, 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 no. And then I had eight, nine, 10 months of nothing and it felt like I was going backwards and, and uh, my feedback was getting worse. And, um, and I was getting nervous again. I had this, this sort of performance anxiety that I had earlier in my career that just started rearing its head. And I had to kind of reconfigure my thinking, you know? Nothing, you know, I'd walk into a situation and there'd be adrenaline and shortness of breath and so on. Instead of thinking, okay, th this signals a tragic situation and I'm gonna fail, I'd think, no, this is excitement. This is signaling my ability to think quicker, see clearer. And that really, you know, reprogram things for me and go, no, I deserve to be here. In 2009, Hemsworth got his break when he was cast by director J.J. Abrams as Captain Kirk's father 
in the Star Trek movie. Let's name him after your dad. Let's call him Jim. I was on my way up to to San Fran, I think I got a phone call saying he would come back to audition for Star Trek. I was like, Star Trek? That old TV show? What, what is this? And like, no, no, no. You auditioned for it like a year ago for, for Kirk. And I was like, did I? Okay. And I said, yeah, come <laughs> back and JJ wants to meet you. He's seen that audition. I'm like, I couldn't even remember what, you know, when it was or what it was. And so I came back and I met with him at his desk, uh, Paramount Studios. And he said, right, hand me the scene. He said, let's just read the scene. And I was like, okay, it's a classic sort of like, Stumbling through the lines, he goes, "Do it again." Don't know. He goes, "Great." Um, do you want to, you, you want the job? I was like, "Yeah." He goes, Great. See you Monday. And um, <laughs> I had no idea that it was a two, three hundred million dollar movie, and it was just big, big event. The film was a box office hit, and Hemsworth's performance caught the attention of the team at Marvel, plotting a movie about the God of Thunder. I will not fight you, brother. Beating out his younger brother Liam for the role, Hemsworth became Thor. This drink, I like it. Another! <laughs> Together, the four Thor movies have made nearly $3 billion and made Hemsworth one of Hollywood's most valuable stars. Did you have a sense when you started Thor just over a decade ago? You couldn't have imagined it was going to be this big and this life-changing. I mean, every job you're hoping it's going to be that. Most days I was spent just waiting for the tap on the shoulder and say, this is not working, kid, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that tap never came. And even the fans inside his own house are asking for more. They're not going to let you go, man. They're too popular. No. My daughter <laughs> said that. I was like, I was like, you know how much I could be home more. She goes, you're not going to act anymore. I was like, maybe I'll just stay home with you. And she goes, my dad, kids want to see you play Thor. I was like, oh, okay. Well, does this kid want to see her dad? No, huh? maybe. <laughs> She's like, eh. She's like, yeah, sometimes. Take care of my crew. This is going to be hard for them. Hurry up. Not her. Have you stopped ever to think about life before and after? It's been wonderful to do something or achieve something that was my dream situation where I'm pinching myself going, oh, I remember when it was the other way, when it was like that. And every time I fly into LA, I pass, you know, casting um, offices and immediately my heart rate goes up. And Still? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just this, like, the nostalgia to it. You know, so many years spent pulling up to those places, sitting in my car going, Okay, come on, we can, come on, let's do this, you know. And then I come here to, to New York and I'm like, wow, this is like, this is the city that most of my favorite movies, this was the backdrop for. And so it brings up all sorts of emotions and feelings mm. and how I felt as a, as a young kid watching films before I even wanted to be an actor, what this place looked like and felt like. And I hope I can just be in a constant state of, of appreciation for it. And you tie it back to your childhood. Yeah. Where you thought, my dad said he could never pay off the loan for the home or the ranch, mm -hmm. and I want to help him pay that off. And so you've just taken taken on everything. Was that a lot of the inspiration for your work ethic to yeah, get to a place sure. where, where maybe you didn't have in your childhood? It was, it, 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 and I had a really interesting period when I finally paid off my parents' house and, and took care of them, and they were able to retire, and family and, and friends as well, and, and went, oh, now what? You know, and it's not that I didn't have a passion and a love for acting and telling stories. My initial attraction to it was as a fan, you know, it wasn't to be an actor. I just wanted to inhabit those spaces. So I was able to develop then sort of a, a new love for it and a different sort of passion. But, you know, we all, you, your purposes change all the time. You have different goals and different reasons for them. And, but I think when it's in sort of some sort of servitude to something outside of yourself, there's a, there's a greater sense of accomplishment.
killing people. I think it feels better than that. Alexandra Daddario has crossed over into the world of the paranormal. Getting angry won't help my patients. In the AMC series Mayfair Witches, she plays Dr. Rowan Fielding, a neurosurgeon who learns she is the latest in a dynasty of powerful witches. Do all the Mayfairs have gifts? We shot in some of the old houses in New Orleans, yeah. which are which are beautiful. It captured perfectly the the feeling of New Orleans, the creepiness of the the books. Did you know anything about these stories when you were handed the script? I didn't actually. I hadn't read Anne Rice growing up. She had this incredible imagination and she would delve into sort of the darker aspects of human nature in this very um, entertaining way. Do you like doing those kind of supernatural horror, I guess you could call it, some combination of those two? I do. I've never expected to do the kinds of things that I've been able to do and work with visual effects and these fantasy stories that really makes it fun and you can go crazy with the characters and really, really push it. The 36-year-old Daddario has been pushing boundaries since she was a kid growing up in New York City. The daughter of two prominent attorneys, Alex, as she is known, opted out of the family business somewhere around the age of 10 after joining a friend at drama class. We had to think of something sad and cry. I, you know, had no idea how to do that. My friend was crying about she had tried to teach her hamster to swim. Oh no. Yeah, it didn't end well. Oh no. And she <laughs> broke down. I shouldn't laugh. But. I know, no, it's not funny. And I will never forget, I was like, oh my goodness. You can take a moment from your real life, something that is, even at a young age, I realized that there was something therapeutic, I think, in that. So I got really into it. Then there were like agents that came to the acting class and they wanted me to do commercials. And so began your hand modeling career for That's Barbie. Right. That's right. Totally hot, totally cool. I was hired as the hand model because they thought I was too old. I was maybe big for 11 or something. Already aging out of parts at 12. I know. I mean, come on. But I was trying so hard to get my face in the <laughs> shot. When you're a kid, everyone's so nice to you. As an adult, you know, people are like, stop doing that. As a kid, they're like, are you comfortable in that position? Like they knew what I was doing. And I had um, a nanny at the time who I believe ended up do, uh, finishing the hand modeling job for me. They sent me home. I ended up getting fired. Oh, you got fired from your first Well, game. I didn't know I was fired, <laughs> but I was. They politely asked you to leave. They said, it's late, go to bed. <laughs> so yeah. as, as this progresses, you do more commercials and you're kind of getting mm -hmm. more serious about it. Mm -hmm. What is your family saying? Because this is new in your family, I take it, right? Were they supportive of it? Or do they think maybe this is a phase for you? Or? You know, people ask me that all the time. They weren't not supportive. I think they were supportive of all my extracurricular activities. I was ice skating and playing sports and all kinds of stuff. You know, and my parents worked a lot and there were three of us. So I think they were glad that I was happy doing this extracurricular activity. They were, they were very supportive in that way. And then as I got older, it started to affect my schooling, mm -hmm. which I think was confusing. Right. But I wouldn't say that they were, you know, they certainly weren't stage parents, but, um, there was actually, I have to say, everything that I did in this business, I did, it was my own decision. Mm -hmm. I was never led into it. I was never encouraged one way or the other because I had to make hard decisions about school. And it was tough, but it just showed me that I really, really wanted to do this because I was making decisions that weren't typical. And so when then does it become, this is what I'm doing? Like this can actually be a career, it's a way I can make money and pay a rent. When I was 16, I booked a soap opera. All my children. Money does not buy happiness. No, it just buys you all the beer you can drink, which I guess to you is happiness. And they did sign me to a contract that I ended up getting let go of after a year. Certainly between getting fired from the soap at 17 and booking my first big movie at 22, there were many <laughs> tears and, you know, I'm quitting, I can't do this. But Daddario hung in, then broke out, playing Annabeth Chase in two film adaptations of the popular Percy Jackson books. 
stand up and fight, hero. I hope that the producers and the director, Chris Columbus, know how grateful I am to them because I know they fought for me and they saw something in me and they plucked me out of obscurity. And I even think that Chris said, you know, something like he was like, there's this crappy little tape and it wasn't filmed well, but your eye is off the screen. And, you know, they called me in for a screen test based off of my tape and gave me the job. And yeah, it, it completely changed my life. It was a big movie, but it wasn't like I was an overnight star. But for me, it made an incredible difference in my career and the opportunities I had. The success of the Percy Jackson films led to roles for Daddario in big budget movies like Texas Chainsaw 3D. They're after me. The 2015 thriller San Andreas, where she starred with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Get down! Get down! And two years later, opposite Zac Efron in the kitschy film reboot of Baywatch. You are trying way too hard. Well, trying's the best part. Baywatch didn't work, and that's not a secret, but it was still huge for me because I was booking jobs off of just booking that job before right. it even came out, which usually everyone in Hollywood waits to see how something does, but it made a, um, it made a big difference for me. Now you've done those big budget movies, you've done all that stuff. What are you thinking post Baywatch about like, do I need to do something darker or something heavier or something more serious? I started trying to do very different things, yeah. And I was um, interested in just trying, having a different experience. And, um, you know, it was part of my learning curve too about what works and because there's all these different business models for making film and television and who's in charge. And so I learned a lot about the studio system versus independent filmmaking and, and how to get financing. And there would be films I started to do that um, we were getting financing as we were going along hmm. some of the time. You just could tell something was going on that right. I had never really experienced do, starting my career doing all of these studio films. And I always just tried to focus on the art and on acting and on, you know, that aspect of it. But I also was, you know, picking up on the business side of it too. Alexandra Daddario has proven she can do much more than summer blockbusters, earning acclaim for her performances in True Detective, American Horror Story Hotel, and season one of the recent HBO sensation, The White Lotus, a dream job she told her agents she had to have. I really want to get a job. No, why would you do that? They were like, we're doing everything possible to get you this job. It was a very, very good job, yeah. And especially being in Hawaii. And sure, you have no idea what something's gonna do. And at that point, I was having issues in my career with what do I wanna do next and my limited opportunities as far as what I wanted to do and what was actually coming in. 
and the auditions I was able to get. Then the pandemic hit and I wasn't thinking so much about career strategy at the time. I was just like, that sounds great. Good people, it's Hawaii, it'll be great. And then it ended up being sort of everything I had been looking for. Why do you think, Alex, it's so registered with people? It became such a thing and did you see it last night? Oh my God, can you believe what happened? There was something about the, every one of those characters was compelling, I think. It wasn't e an easy show to watch, but you also loved watching it yes. and combining the humor with the weird and with this social commentary, I think it, it, you know, you couldn't keep your eyes off of it. And it had great music and the actors mm. were all great and Mike really knows how to capture a moment. I think I made a mistake. What's a mistake? The mistake is getting married. Daddario earned an Emmy nomination playing a newlywed on a nightmare honeymoon in Hawaii. What did you like about your character? Who, as I said, we became close with as viewers. We sympathized with her. We felt what she was going through. What did you like about her? I really saw in that character someone who she was sort of helpless. And I sort of, I think I was able to draw a little bit from myself and some aspects of trying to always make every, it's gonna be okay, and getting carried away with things. And also I think her character, she's sort of innocent in a way. She had a, an idea of how things were gonna be. And I think I can do that sometimes. And I think that's caused me some success and caused me some failure. I mean, the fantasy of things are what caused me to, you know, empty out my bank account and move to LA at 22 with no college degree and say I'm going to go make it. So it can be beneficial but it can also be detrimental as we see in The White Lotus. I think she has a fantasy of how things are going to be with this man in her life and she's realizing as she's going along that that's just not, it's not what she thought it was going to be and for some reason on this honeymoon is when it really all comes to a head. And I, I was really fascinated by um, that idea of our fantasy and then how we've sort of tricked ourselves into going along with something that's not really good for us. And it's crushing to watch because she's a week into her marriage and she realizes, oh my gosh, this is what it's going to be for the rest of my life. And she makes her decision to stay because yeah. it's too hard to think of the alternative. She's still having a fantasy even though she knows in her heart, she's still at the end holding on to this idea that it's all going to be okay and she can, she can change it. And there's something so heartbreaking to that and relatable for me. Daddario wrote a happy ending to her own real life love story. You also had some great news over the pandemic and that you met and married your husband. Congratulations. Yes. yes. What's that been like for you? It's been great. He's a, a wonderful man, but I've always wanted to be a mom and be married. And you guys bumped into each other right on the streets, right out here somewhere. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> or some version of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I told Vogue that, you know, and you called me out. You said, that sounds like a Nora Ephron movie. Mm -hmm. I did add a little romantic twist to our meeting, but we did actually have our first date right next door. And then on our second date, I brought my dog and the dog wandered into the kitchen and they, the people working in the kitchen just sort of were like, oh, hey, here's your dog. So it really is a Nora Ephron movie, the dog wandering in the kitchen. Well, that did happen, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll that. that part did we'll take that part of it.
Savannah, you got to catch up with one of probably your most favorite people, Miss mm. Kristen Chenoweth. Oh, she's a legend. You yeah. know, she was just down the street. She met us at historic St. Patrick's Cathedral. Honestly, we could have talked for hours. Kristen, of course, needs no introduction. She's a Tony and Emmy winner and has transformed Broadway with her starring roles in Wicked and You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Yeah. Well, she credits God and her faith with helping her get to the main stage. And as a Christian, she believes it's her mission to share God's love. And whether that is on the Broadway stage or walking down the streets of New York, she's finding a different kind of voice. I can't believe we're here. Can you believe we're here? You got your start singing in church. I did. Not a church like this one, though. Oh, no, no. Uh, mine was in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and it only had about 1,000 people in, in membership. But God was a huge part of my life. How I found my gift was through church music. What does it feel like to sing a great hymn, like How Great Thou Art, and be able to sing it like you? I feel, <laughs> thank you so much for making me cry. It's, it gets me back to my roots. Whenever I sing, you mentioned Great Is Thy Faithfulness earlier, and I, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, I just, the echo. Morning by morning, morning new, new mercies I see. Take my mic down. <laughs> Never. You have a song in your heart, and you should sing it. Maybe not as loud as me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not as loud as you. I'll lip sync. Would you say you first found your voice in yeah. church? I was in the choir, little kids' choir, and my, they were having an audition for an adult solo. And my mom said, you can't, you're a kid. I said, let me just go try out. You know, that says a lot about me at that age. So I went and I got the solo. They were like, we're gonna give it to you. And then that Sunday I sing the solo and the church erupts. And I say this story only to tell you that when you're a little kid and the encouragement you get from people that love mm. you to follow the passion that you love, I was given an opportunity to sing about something that I believe in, which is faith. Mm and do it in front of people who love me, a very safe space. It started the ball rolling. And I love to sing for all kinds of faiths because I believe that we, we worship a God that is loving, not one that is man has made. So you're going to hell mm. and a loving God. And if I can spread that joy, then I'm gonna try because that was one of the things God told me when I was a little girl. People go, oh, he actually, he spoke, hey, Chris, you know? Yeah. I get these impressions on my heart. I don't know how else to explain it. It's a still, small voice. And when I get that impression, it's like a handprint, like, yes, that's correct. It's interesting about God's voice because um, it's hard to describe, although actually I think you describe it really well. Thank you. But I often find it is saying something that is unexpected. Yes, yes. I remember Savannah even talking about my adoption. And I've just started talking about it recently because, because I got the impression in my heart, this will help other people. People need to know that you just weren't in, in this world magically. They need to know what was behind it. It will inspire people. And so it's become a lot more easier for me to talk about, but if I couldn't listen, I would have kept that secret, and I'm not ashamed of it. Kristen was adopted as a newborn. Her adoptive mother happened to be in the hospital the same day she was born for an operation that would leave her unable to conceive. By chance or heavenly plan, Kristen unexpectedly became available for adoption. She said to the doctor, I always wanted to try for a little girl and now I won't be able to. And he remembered that story. So when my birth mom, Mama Lynn, came to give birth, she, they called my dad before and said, do you want to surprise Junie tomorrow? Because I've got a little baby here that's going to need a home. And my dad said, yeah. And so they kind of took my mom, robed her up and day of her surgery and took her down to the babies. And they said, see that baby? That's your baby. So she's waiting on you when you get done. And so we went home together. And she said, I always felt like I had you because we went home together. And I mean, how can I, me personally, not believe in miracles? Mm. I got the perfect family. I was brought into this world by the wonderful mother, Mama Lynn, and I was able to get an education. I grew up in a loving, giving family, one full of faith and a lot of fun too. And 
you know, it's a gift. It's a gift. So that's a miracle. But how does Mama Lynn, did she sing? Yes. Okay. And the, my birth father was a great musician as well, mm -hmm. Billy Etheridge. And some people might know who he is out there, but so I know where it came from. Mm -hmm. And she's petite. I got her height. People say nature versus nur mm -hmm. nurture. I think no, nature and nurture mm -hmm. is what it is. It's such a beautiful alchemy, the story. You know, it's yeah. like this magic. It's divine. It's divine. It's divine. You've had ups and downs in your career. You've talked about how you've looked for God's voice yeah. to guide you. Yeah. How has that helped you make decisions that might have been a little surprising at the time, or a little yeah. unorthodox or off the beaten path? It's been really interesting because I have a a wonderful team that works for me to help me guide with these decisions. Even when I was younger, I was lucky enough to get a great agent. I went to New York with my friend Denny to help him audition and get settled in. And I thought, maybe I'll just try out for something for fun, have the experience. And I ended up getting this part. And I had a big decision to make. And this is where I talk about the gut. This is where I talk about that impression. Some people call it the universe. That's fine. For me, it's the Lord. But I have to get quiet. My whole life I've heard from my aunts and my mom, two ears, one mouth, Kristen. Two ears, one mouth. <laughs> Speak less and listen more, because you know I can talk. <laughs> and when I do that, I'm able to kind of hear what God wants from me. And I went to New York. I said, I want to do this thing, and it worked out. So God has other plans sometimes, and it's happened several times in my career. But faith is a journey, and not always an easy one. Along with great success, Kristen has had great setbacks, including an onset accident that nearly killed her a decade ago. Severely injured, the road back was a crucible. It was horrific and scary and awful. Now, I could go in the path of bitterness and anger, and I did for a while, I did. But I could let all that go. It happened. So guess what I'm gonna choose? That way. And a lot of it is up to us. He gave us a mind and for me to just, I don't guess I'm preaching, but for me to talk about that, that'll be something I really want people to know. Have you ever had doubt, seasons of doubt or disconnection with God? Yes. The big question of why God me? Yeah. Why me, God? I've had several injuries. You know, I'm in a, I'd like to say I'm an athlete. All my Broadway people know what I mean. People that tour, they know what I mean. I asked my mom one day, this was after this accident. I had to kind of relearn how to get some of my sentences out, land the plane, so to speak. I, my physical, physical body is not the same as it was. And I had a big pity party. And they, were, they stayed with me for three months to help me walk and things. She said, why not you? I said, what do you mean? Like, I'm crying. She goes, of course, do I want this for my daughter? No, but why not you? You know better or worse than anybody else. Things happen to everybody. 
you're on a mission to spread the love of God. I mean, that's it. Wait, that's you know, but also when you do fall and you mess up and we all have, you get this amazing gift, which is God's grace. It's an incredibly bonding experience with God. When you know you did something wrong and you feel that on your heart, you are forgiven. I mean, you're so right to bring that up, grace. Growing up, my mom always said, Junie, channel with I love you. She said, uh, if you wanna be forgiven, you have to forgive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's hard. It's hard. And it's later in life, because I'm a Leo and I'm very loyal and I expect it back by people that love me. And when I've been hurt in the past, I have held on to it and it has hurt me. So just recently, this is a, a fact, I've started forgiving people that I feel have hurt me that don't even care anymore or know about it because <laughs> I'm the one that's hurting and that's God's grace. He says, see my child, if you'd done this the whole time, you wouldn't have carried that, that on your journey. I think that's so unique to God's character, if you will. When he tells us something, even something we don't really want to do, like forgive someone who hurt you. Yeah. He's not doing it for them. He's doing it for you. Yeah, it's true. And I've had tro more trouble, Savannah, learning to forgive myself mm. when I have disappointed others, disappointed myself. Mm. I'm very hard on myself. Type A, your average nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Learning to forgive yourself is the most important so that you can move forward. At my church, the pastor says, one way to define sin is just the way we fall short of love. Oh my gosh, say that again. Sin is just the way that we fall short of love. And I think that's a more accurate way to describe it yes. and more matches up with what, you know, what God intends. I agree. I so agree. I love that. I'm gonna remember that in my head because it is all about love, isn't it? Yeah, we don't have these conversations all that much. Not anymore. And there's a way to talk about it, I think, in love and openness without judgment or some kind of, I don't know. Cutting think, off, Yeah. closing down the wall. And you know what it comes down to? We're all God's children. I know. Everybody gets in on it. It's, it's, I think if we thought about that more, yeah. it would be transforming. Then we really would be look at each other as brother and sister instead yes. of the enemy. In this family together. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what God wants us to do. Don't you, Savannah. Upon this rock. So on this day, Kristen Chenoweth, who God gave the voice of an angel, raised hers loud and strong, and we were blessed.
he uh, waiting for us. So that was very thoughtful yeah. of you. And I bought out the restaurant. So. <laughs> so we could have a really private conversation. Exactly. Yeah. With another glitzy award season behind her, Michelle Williams is happy to be back home in New York. You've been a New Yorker for a long time. Something about this place, I just can't really imagine ever leaving it. The 42-year-old is fresh off of a fifth career Oscar nomination for her starring role in The Fablements, a semi-autobiographical film about Steven Spielberg's childhood, in which she plays the director's mother, Mitzi. You do what your heart says you have to, so you don't owe anyone your life. Did you feel it in the moment when you were making it that this is something special? Well, it felt special to me. I mean, the moment that I read the script and just saw, like, this gorgeous, gorgeous story with these, like, big, beautiful scenes and the enormity of Stephen's heart and his life experience with the collaboration between himself and Tony Kushner on this, uh, on the dialogue, I knew it was really special. It was just, like, the most gorgeous script ever. So um, I had a sense of what it could be, and then like, and then the work begins, and then it's the like, okay, how do I live up to that? My 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 strongest feeling was, all right, this thing like the script is so beautiful, it's it's flawless, it exists. You just have to jump up and be able to meet it. Like you just have to like, it's a high bar, and you have to hope you can jump jump up and catch it. Mm. Did you feel any? relationship to Mitzi as a mother of three yourself, like, I hope to be this way for my kids. I served watching, oh, yeah. I served had yeah. some of that, like, am I like that? I want to be that way, you know? Did you feel any of that as a mother? I still think about, like, the spirit of Mitzi as a mother. I still think about, you know, she, she raised four children, and all four of them adore her. And she gave them what children really want, which is attention and the ability to play. It was very poignant to read and to see how strongly Stephen felt. For obvious reasons, it was a story yeah. sort of about his family, and that when he saw you first as Mitzi, he just broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. Did that feel like a responsibility to Stephen to get that right, because you're sort of carrying his family story along? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I, you know, that first day when, I, when he broke down, um, I, my heart went out to him and I wanted to offer him comfort and inside I'm thinking, oh, thank God, like, it's working. Like, whatever right. it is, like, we're, we're, we're starting, we're, we're in a good starting place. For her next project, Williams returns to the professional place where she feels most at home, independent film. Good job, Eric. In Showing Up, Williams plays a sculptor on deadline for a show but distracted by the mundane challenges of daily life. It is her fourth movie with director Kelly Reichardt, dating back to their acclaimed 2008 film, Wendy and Lucy. Is it true that at this point she calls and says, I'm working on something, and you just cut her off and say yes? Yeah. You just do it, really, without seeing the script or anything like that? You're just in at yeah, this point. Yeah, that's what happened this time. That's she amazing. She called and said, you know, I've got something for us. And we got off the phone, and I said to my husband, well, I've got a job, and <laughs> sounds like we're going to Portland, and I think it'll be in the spring. And, you know, and then a few days later, the script arrives. But, um, you know, it just makes your life feel like long. When you can work with your friends mm. and stay in touch with them artistically and emotionally. It makes your life feel long and supple, and um, and I hope that we have like many, many points of return over the next 15 years. That's a rare relationship, though, is it not? Yeah, it I mean, really there aren't is. that many it's of special, those in your it? business, yeah. right, where you just yeah. say, let's jump together and see what happens? I know, it really is, it really amazes me, because truly, like, just to make one of those movies with her was beyond my wildest dreams. Um, it, it occurred to me when she offered me this movie, I thought, like, this is going to be, like, the headline of my obituary, <laughs> like, that we, um, that I was, like, a, a contributor to the Kelly Reichardt body of work because mm. she's, she's become acknowledged as, you know, not just an important American filmmaker, but an important international filmmaker. Is this the kind of movie you like the most to make? I mean, you've done everything. You've done huge budget movies and you've done art movies and everything else, you just feel very comfortable in this arena with this director. Is that fair to say? 
Well, it feels it feels like very true to my heart and to why I even wanted to act in the first place. Oh, I really just wanted to make independent cinema. I wanted to make a home for myself and a life for myself and my family in independent cinema. That was my that was like what I had in my eye. You know, that was like my it was my dream. And so to to have branched out and sort of made bigger movies and to be comfortable in that arena also was a really big deal for me and took a lot of sort of work to like expand the space that I could mm. um, allow myself to fill. But these movies feel like where my heart is. Off screen, William's heart is in Brooklyn, where she lives with her husband, director Thomas Kale of Hamilton fame, and their children, a world away from rural Kalispell, Montana, where her own story began. I'm sure growing up in Montana, Hollywood seemed like it was a different planet. So when did you start dreaming about being an actor? Where did that come from in that childhood of yours? It was, when we lived in Montana, I was, I don't think I even, I think I probably thought that like people lived in the TV set. And <laughs> um, so I really didn't have like any concept of that that was a, a job or like something that people did. And, and then at a certain point we moved to San Diego and that's when, you know, San Diego's close to Los Angeles and there were just other kids that were acting. I don't really know how to describe it. It was just something that I kind of got swept up in without really being super intentional about it. Mm. It was just something that other people were doing and then suddenly I was one of the people that was doing it and no real rhyme or reason, like no, school nobody plays, in my, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, like school plays, yeah, yeah. And, but nobody in my family had any connections to Los Angeles or the film industry and all of a sudden I was just like a kid in a carpool that was sort of going up and back and forth for these auditions. And you did pretty well. You got uh, some parts. Eventually, eventually, not at the beginning. I auditioned for two years in the beginning without ever getting a job. Oh, was that right? And I, that was auditioning regularly. I mean, mm -hmm. I was constantly going up and back for commercial auditions, TV show auditions, but I, I never got a single one. So I don't really know why they kept taking me there. <laughs> but she kept at it with small parts, including a role on Baywatch. Her big break came at 16, when she was cast on the hit teen drama, Dawson's Creek. Dawson, you just, you just try too hard. You're overzealous. It's my downfall. I love how even recently you've been talking about the foundation that that yeah, gave you, and the people you yeah. worked with, and your grams, and how you draw a line through everything back to Dawson's Creek. What do you mean when you say that? What was that education you got there? I think it was a few things. I think you know it was it was really a stabilizing force because I was I was quite young, um, but it taught me how to be responsible. It taught me how to get to work on time. It taught me how to prepare at night for the next day. It taught me sort of like the basics of how to take care of myself, in a way that we were in like a very sleepy southern town. And the crew really felt like they looked out for us. They knew how young we were. And they kind of put like bumpers around us, you know, mm. just made sure that we were safe and taken care of.
soon after Dawson's Creek ended, Williams landed the role that would change her life in Brokeback Mountain, alongside Anne Hathaway, Jake Gyllenhaal, and the late Heath Ledger, who would become the father of her daughter. What was that time in your life like? It was huge for you, personally and professionally, just to be a part of something that really had such an impact on the culture. Yeah, so hugely, um, and continues you know, I think that was such a big experience, I mean, in so many ways. But it was really, I mean, I sort of was on the side of it. I was watching, you know, what, how, how men reacted and how they would relate to Heath and Jake when they, the emotion that they held finally being able to see themselves um, on screen. And so to be part of something that felt like that wasn't just a movie. That yeah. was, a, you know, a profound moment. I don't know what you would call it. Like, just I, it's not even political. It's just on a like an incredible on a on a human level. So to be a part of a movie that sort of transcends the the film and you know speaks to people in such a deep way. And then the four of you sort of find yourself at the Oscars and all these things are changing in your life. I, <laughs> I mean, to step into that world really for the first time, I think it's fair to say. What did that do to your life? I mean, it had a big impact on a lot of people's lives outside of yours, but what did it mean to yours? Oh, it was such a shock. I mean, like, you know, I was on Baywatch, so <laughs> those, those two things, I don't know, they go together. But it was, uh, it was wonderful, you know? We had a part of this, you know, important movie, and we had a beautiful, healthy little baby, and it was a, it was a, it was a great moment in time. And then from there, you go on in your career, doors sort of open and you get all these opportunities. So was that a fun time for you to sort of just look at the world and read scripts and be in demand a little bit after that? I don't that? know, I think it was really unnerving, you know, sort of after that, like, well, what do you do? What do you do next? I had never, I'd right. never felt like people, I never really had attention on me before in that kind of a way. And I think, mm. you know, well, now it feels like, a, well, people are watching. What if I make a mistake? Mm. That's really scary what would happen to me. So I think I felt a little bit f frozen for a moment. That feeling didn't last long. Williams went on to earn Oscar nominations for Blue Valentine, My Week with Marilyn, and Manchester by the Sea, and won an Emmy and a Golden Globe for her performance in the series Fosse Verdon. But it does feel like you you made smart decisions along the way. Is there a strategy to that for you? Or you just say, I like that director, I wanna work with her or with him? Yeah, is that yeah, it's, no, it it's very instinctive. It's like a reaction that happens between you and a piece of material, or it doesn't. Hmm. Um, what about this is going to actually work on me and expand me as a person, as a mother? Which raises the question, what's next for you? Who what's knows? still out there? Is there more? Is there directing? Is there, feels like the world's open to you and you're always open to whatever's thrown at you, it seems like. Um, I am, I do, uh, I like to, I like to be surprised. Like I like to sort of not know what's next and then to sort of be struck by the feeling of, oh, this is it. You like to be a little scared or not know what's around the corner? Yeah, I do, I like yeah. to not know. Yeah, well, it seems to be working for you. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, so far so good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michelle, it's great to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much, thank you. it's such a pleasure.